please welcome the president of Atlantic Live, Margaret Lowe. Good morning, Philadelphia. Hello. It's wonderful to see such a full house this morning. I, I have to say, um, we crisscrossed the country doing events like this, and I'm impressed with how bright and early everybody was here. So it's wonderful to welcome you to Examining Modern Medicine. We've taken this series across the country this year, from Boston to New York, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, to explore some of the big issues at the forefront of healthcare today, everything from personalized medicine to genomics, biotech innovations, and health policy. And today, we're going to zoom in on vaccines and immunity. And I'm going to just a little history first before we begin. Physicians and scientists have been searching for ways to prevent disease since Hippocrates. And he was around a long time ago. 450 BC is when he was born. But things really kicked in 200 plus years ago in, 19, in 1796 when an English doctor named Edward Jenner created the very first vaccine. He used cowpox material to create immunity to smallpox. Louis Pasteur developed the rabies vaccine more than 100 years later. And perhaps the greatest vaccinologist, or per certainly the most prolific, Maurice Hilleman, uh, the American microbiologist who died 12 years ago, created over 40 vaccines, among them vaccines for measles, mumps, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, chickenpox, and meningitis. The next frontier is the eradication of polio and vaccines for HIV, Ebola, Zika, and even cancer. And this morning, we'll talk about that with scientists, doctors, policymakers, and public health leaders. And this conversation won't just be about the creation of vaccines, but about the benefits to our society and the underlying scientists. I do want to take a moment to thank our underwriter, Pharma, for making this morning possible. Thank you to Pharma. We wouldn't be here without them, so thank you. Uh, and now a few practical notes before we begin. Um, please silence your cell phones, but don't put them away because we'd love you to join us on Twitter. Use the hashtag Atlantic Medicine. Um, and don't forget, you have uh, 280 characters now as opposed to 140, so please go wild. Uh, we want you to be part of the conversation in the room, too, so, use, uh, so we'll leave time for your questions throughout the morning. And now we will roll. We'll begin with the latest science coming out of the lab. To kick us off, please welcome Leonard Friedland. He's Vice President and Director of Scientific Affairs and Public Health at Vaccines North America at GSK. Welcome. Francis Pretty is the Chief Medical Officer and Executive Director of Medical Affairs at the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. Welcome. And David Weiner is the Executive Vice President and Director of the Vaccine Center at the Y Star Institute. Welcome to you, too. And last but not least, here to lead the conversation is my colleague, Steve Clemens, Washington at Editor at Large for The Atlantic. Steve. Thank you. Have a seat, guys. I, I was having fun. I mean, I'm going to do a shout out to Paul Offit back here. I mean, one, it's great you're here early. Paul, you're the last speaker of the day, I think, uh, with me later. But I was listening to him talk about the room here and the people here. And he said, you know, if I were to have like a holiday party of all my vaccine buddies, they're all here. So we're very happy that uh, uh, we, you don't have to have that party. You're having it here today. Um, our, our job, is, as Margaret just said, is to you know, help benchmark for a moment where we are in the science and where we're going in the science. And Len, I wanted to just talk to you about, we were having a, you know, interesting chat in the back about what, I, I, I sometimes sort of always feel this tension because I'm a journalist. I want to know the dark, the depressing, the, uh, uh, the things that aren't working out. And you said, we're really at a historic moment, an inflection moment, where the excitement in this field is, is greater than it's been before. So I just want you to take us there for a moment. Why are you such an optimist? Oh, well, thanks. And good morning, everybody. Now, we're absolutely at a golden age right now in vaccinology. The opportunities that we have to take advantage of the knowledge that we've been gaining through immunology, biology, microbiology, genomics, and to translate it into advances for patient care is just absolutely incredible. I think the, the boundaries are endless for what we can do now translating science into access for patients and improving patient health. And we've seen just in the last year uh, a new vaccine, for example, just a few weeks ago for shingles that has a remarkable opportunity to help prevent disease and its complications in the elderly, populations that have been very difficult to develop effective 
vaccines for. So I'm incredibly optimistic because our community is really banding together to advance science and it's just absolutely phenomenal. What was the game changer that changed the terrain? I mean, let me just presuppose an event. I, I had the pleasure at another uh, event um, like this of interviewing one of your colleagues, Rip Ballou, mm -hmm. who's been with uh, GSK for a long time. And this guy, I think about 20 years ago, injected himself with malaria uh, and, then, and, then, and then tried to Vac had, had va tried to vaccinate himself and then put his arm in with mosquitoes. Have you done that? Do you do those kind of things? <laughs> I haven't, I haven't uh, put my arm into a box and been bitten by mosquitoes, but what I have done is I've immersed myself around talented people who are mm -hmm. interested in understanding what the challenges are and thinking how can we address these challenges to advance patient health. And that's what the whole vaccine community is all about, is people focusing in on what's best for patients, taking the knowledge that we have, and working across, uh, across groups, uh, academia, government, industry, all working together right. to advance science. And it's just a phenomenal time. And you were asking what's been the game changers. I'd say the game changers are understanding science and then rationally developing vaccines. So we've moved from empiric approaches mm -hmm. to vaccine development to rational approaches to vaccine development developing molecular signatures for which we can test and refine, use new antigens, new adjuvants, new technologies to build on that signature and advance it into the next mm -hmm. stage. And one of the goals in the future is actually to move into clinical development faster and being able to study fewer patients because we understand the signature of what it is that we're looking to address. Fran, should those people that are thinking about international AIDS vaccines and the challenge that we've seen globally on HIV AIDS um, feel the same enthusiasm that Len just shared? Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I definitely agree, um, first of all, with the idea that it's a group of very motivated, committed people banding together. Right. That's true. I think it's, it's important for people to realize that you have people from academia, governments, um, governments all around the world, industry working together on HIV vaccines. So I think that's key. But the science also, um, the past decade or so, because HIV is such a challenging uh, virus to make a vaccine for, which we could spend a lot of time talking about, it really has accelerated scientific discovery. Mm -hmm. And it's taken, we, people have moved away from more traditional forms of making vaccines and gone on to look for other fields and bring new innovations into the vaccine field. And it's really driven the science forward. So I think yeah, also- Can you break that down for me? I mean, what, what does that actually mean? I, what I'm trying to do is get the building blocks of yeah. what changed. So when you're excited and you're talking about people coming together, what are actually the building blocks that you think were game changers um, as you tried to put it? Because we don't have it. We don't have a vaccine in your field yet. Right, right. Um, well, I think one thing is understanding the biology of the virus better. So mm -hmm. the virology of HIV, and this is true for many other infectious diseases and viruses now that we're trying to develop vaccines for, but really understanding, and one of the keys to understanding that was the drive to find effective treatment for HIV. So that really pushed the field forward in, in virology. So we understand how the virus uh, replicates. And now what we're trying to do is understand how can we train the body's immune system. And, and we're using some new techniques um, to understand how can we train the body's immune system to develop a protective immune response against HIV. That's one thread of the vaccine field is working towards um, how can we get a vaccine that's going to give us broadly neutralizing antibody responses that may, may protect from HIV? In the past, um, with vaccine development, I wouldn't say it was easier. We know it's always been a long road, but um, being able to use killed, um, uh, killed organisms or killed virus or weakened viruses worked mm -hmm. as a vaccine. With HIV and some of the other um, uh, difficult diseases we're dealing with now, that doesn't work. So we need to apply these new scientific approaches. You know, before I get to Dave, and I understand as the historian knows so much of, 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 of this area over a period of history, you just mentioned adjutants and you mentioned a lot of the, Len, a lot of the advancements that are coming on to sort of help the, the body regain its, its um, uh, immune capacity or its immune system. And I, you know, so much, when you would, if you were in the cancer forum yesterday um, uh, that pharma helped support, you had other uh, sessions immunotherapy or playing around with the immune system, turning gene, you know, things on and off in the system. Do you, do you worry about that, that at some level um, you're going to create not just cures and vaccines for certain kinds of things, but, 
but I, I met a guy once who said, look, I'm one of 5,000 people in the world who could really create something really awful, awful for mankind. And I'm just wondering what the downsides are of some of what we're researching. Do you, do you feel a responsibility to think that through as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, patient safety is the number one priority in vaccine development. It's at the top of the list always, and right. we never lose focus on this. We always look to uh, the benefit versus the risk, right. and that, that ratio, let's say, and if the ratio favors benefit over risk, then we proceed forward. But we never stop. We're always looking at patient safety before vaccines get into people, when they're in clinical trials, and of course, after. Uh, and they're widely used. And um, we are very fortunate here in the United States that we have the most robust and really fantastic and very effective safety monitoring systems. Real-time safety data coming from the government, coming from industry, and coming from academia. And uh, we utilize the safety network to evaluate what we're doing. But we're always looking at benefit versus harm. And when the benefit outweighs the harm, then we move forward to advanced patient health. And with new technologies comes a responsibility. Of mm -hmm. course it does. And the responsibility is also to advance patient health. You'd mentioned adjuvants, Steve. Adjuvants are compounds that help to enhance and shape the immune response. Right. Uh, at GSK, we, over 20 years ago, focused in on adjuvants as a, as a research platform. Uh, it takes a long-term view to advance science, particularly in vaccinology. Over 20 years of development, you mentioned the malaria vaccine, over 30 years of development, that vaccine utilizes an adjuvant in its formulation. And we are now seeing that this science is translating into advances in patient health. So it's really exciting, and at the same time, it's a tremendous responsibility to make sure that what we're doing benefits right. people. Dave, I know that you're in this, in this, you know, basically helping to bring this DNA uh, response in and, and interested in how you see, you know, the arena of, of, of progression in vaccine science from a different corner. So I guess um, there's a lot that we've been talking about. Maurice Hillman said all the easy targets have already been taken mm -hmm. and um, now the ones are more difficult. But I also think the question of safety really is going to be addressed better than we've ever been able to do before with some of the newer approaches than we had the opportunity to do in the past. If you just think about the problem we have with developing a vaccine for mm -hmm. the pediatric population, there are more than three million children born each year. And as far as I know, there's no possible assay we can do in three million children mm -hmm. to ensure complete protection with uh, some strategies in every one of those child because you can't do three million animals. Right. But there are new technologies that allow us to jump over hurdles that we used to have concerns about with the way we develop them and these allow us to do things much faster. Nucleic acid, some of the um, non-replicating vectors, the pr recombinant protein plus adjuvant that Len talked about, these are all um, much more, you can have much better understanding with many of them than we ever did before. And, and they also protect the populations that are emerging today that didn't exist when Maurice was really pioneering his work, um, which include people on biologics, um, cancer survivors, uh, immune deficiency disorders, cystic fibrosis, uh, on and on. And those people can't take live vaccines for the mm -hmm. most part. Um, my daughter uh, has Crohn. She can't take most live vaccines. And these new technologies protect uh, those populations and uh, the newer populations. And so tell us about your work specifically, what you're bringing in, in, this, in this DNA vaccine. So what uh, my, my group is focused on is the area of uh, using snippets of DNA, um, non-live, non-replicating, mm -hmm. they don't grow, and they don't become part of our bodies, they don't integrate, they're temporary. When we had uh, everyone here having breakfast, probably is consuming a gram of DNA and mm -hmm. it's easily disposed of or quite used to destroying uh, nucleic acid in the environment. Uh, but yet those instructions can then be delivered inside of our cells uh, temporarily and they instruct the cells to make the vaccine. And so it's customized, it's produced, uh, the person is the factory, not an outside factory. And it solves a lot of other conceptual issues in vaccines. It solves the whole that each vaccine needs its own basically plant or part of the plant um, and you can't change over technologies easier. And, and several of these nucleic acid technologies promise much faster to the clinic. For example, um, in the Zika outbreak, 
we developed the first vaccine that went in the clinic and reported on it um, in New England Journal just a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And that was only seven months from no vaccine to actually the first uh, opening of the clinic. So that, those kind of things really can help us in pandemics. And also you can think of a bridge to um, person-specific medicine. Let me ask you guys a quick question, and perhaps this politically incorrect question, but what's the business of vaccines? Um, if you have sort of a large incidence event out there, that seems to me a good business, a good investment you can go out and kind of deal with. If you have something like Ebola, I've talked to folks at Merck, talked to folks at GSK, and, and, and really that is you know, something where there's huge expectations of the corporate community, of the research community to go out and solve it, but there's not a lot of, of dollars and money that is naturally just sitting out there to go and, and, and help this. And I'm interested, is, is that a problem? Is there a problem out there for the next pandemic that we don't see coming down the road? that it, it, these things happen small, they, they, they require a kind of build up to, to, to generate attention. So, so tell me where I'm wrong in that, because I, we do see in, the, in sort of the business of vaccinology and the business of the large scale global firms, some drawback, I think, it's some concern that, that perhaps the, the way in which firms are rewarded is not in line with actual the need out there as we look at, at the next emerging pathogens. Len? How much time do we have? <laughs> you know, this is a, a really, really a critically important issue uh, because on one level, uh, it, it, it speaks to how do we value innovation? Right. How do we value the opportunities that science can deliver for patient health? But at the same time, uh, this challenge creates an opportunity. We need to think of new models, mm -hmm. new ways of valuing innovation and bringing advances to patient health. And the crises that occurred with um, Ebola, uh, with uh, the pandemic of 2009, um, now uh, beginning of, of Zika, creates the opportunity to think of new models. The standard way of developing vaccines has worked really well, yet it's not a model for the future for rare uh, emerging infections or diseases that impact smaller parts of our population. And um, we're seeing tailwinds here. We're seeing new developments, new groups, international consortiums getting together to try to tackle this issue. Has it been solved? No. Uh, is it going to get solved? I'm optimistic that it will, uh, because we really recognize as a world community how important it is to address this. So the answer isn't here today, uh, but it's clearly happening. People like Stanley Plotkin and others are really devoted to making the world a better place in the future by creating new models for how we can bring uh, non-traditional market-oriented right. vaccines to bear. Fran, do you have yeah. thoughts on this? Because you, you, you're very yeah. much in this space and you also deal with the African continent. You've got a lot of global players involved with a huge, huge effort. And I often ask people, you know, what, what do you not have? I mean, you do have so many resources and you know, some of these forums tend to be rah-rah. Everything's great, science great, platform. Yeah. What's missing, what's not great that's inhibiting your ability to achieve the success you want? Um, well, I mean, I think HIV is different in that it's not um, an Ebola outbreak that you right. mentioned, you know, how can we respond? But actually, a lot of the things that Len said are, are, are very applicable, and I, I don't think we can expect one component of product development like pharma to be responsible for everything. Right. So we need the countries where people are most infected to also play a role. And then groups, uh, IAVI is a small uh, group, uh, you know, nonprofit product development partnership trying to fill the gap where there's difficulties for pharma to see a business case. Um, there can be other groups that come in and do uh, a lot of the earlier work and show that there's some benefit of a particular vaccine and then there can be a larger partnership to take it forward. So I think, um, if you ask me what's missing in HIV, I think that um, really it comes down to the science. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do think that there's enough parties interested in making an HIV vaccine um, we have a lot of very good partnerships. We could use a little more support from the countries, mm -hmm. um, the governments of the countries that we're working in in terms of financial support, but that's super challenging for these countries, which mm -hmm. have so many health issues to deal with. Um, we have political will, but the science is really, really key for HIV, and that's really what, why it's been such a long road for an HIV vaccine. I'd, I'd say that's the main, main reason. Dave, what do you think about the economics of this? Economics. Yeah. 
Well, uh, or maybe you're in the in the research area. You don't have to worry about the economics. No, no. Of it. I think the, the economics are. You guys should um, change difficult. jobs for like two weeks and see. Uh, That'd be good. So, yeah. so I guess yeah. you know, vaccines are very very important, but uh, you know we have very unusual demands on vaccines. So we mentioned safety. When I say safety, we want vaccines right. to be safer than water. Because yeah. if three million, if you go three million in the birth cohort, you have more kids having ba bathing accidents than we expect to get from vaccines. So when I say safety, I want to be clear. That's what I mean. It's not they're safe; they're extraordinarily safe. And then uh, that, of course, uh, it is expensive mm. to do what Len said and make sure everyone is protected and safely. That's an enormous task. It's much higher bar than we set for almost anything else. Uh, and so that's a, a big challenge, and that's cost. So uh, that's an issue, and I think that's reflected in some of the consolidation in the industry. We really only have five major players. We have smaller players, but we have five major players, and and therefore, you know, you uh, all of us that work then work with some of those, and that uh, you know can slow things down. It would be. Um, improved if we can get newer technologies that have a broader base in the population and have more um, uh, ways to go. Um, and that would be an, an important thing. And I think that's sort of a reflection of how difficult vaccines are to make and to the responsibility of making them safely and getting them out there and so reproducible. It's caused that um, shrinkage, which uh, I think if we go back to the 80s, there were about 27 mm. uh, larger companies. So, so that's a real big difference. And I think the newer technologies likely are critically important because some of that winnowing is because of the reliance on these older, very difficult. Where, where are we on the, I guess we call the delivery or the distribution or the, um, the, the, the shots of vaccines? Is there, is there much innovation going on? I've always sort of felt, I mean, you know, I'm gonna put something on the table here about myself. I hate needles, right? So a lot of the world hates needles. But I mean, when you begin looking, at it, there's not just innovation in the vaccine. There's innovation in the way we, we're looking at delivering. But where are we with that? And 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 is that a game changer? When Dave, you're talking about trying to achieve a safety dimension that is that is safer than water. Clearly, there's a marketing challenge out there, right? So one is to get the fact of the of of, of that out there. The other is to convince the public. Um, that, that it's, and we're going to get that to that issue through the day. But where are we in terms of innovation and new possibilities in the delivery of vaccines to a population? Dave? So I guess that is always dependent on the way we feel about them. I don't think uh, in the Ebola outbreak there was any problem giving people a needle. Right. Because uh, they felt the immediate like need. They felt the need. And I think one of the true reasons we even have that question is because of how wonderfully successful and safe vaccines are. <laughs> we don't mm -hmm. worry about uh, rubella because of a stand. We don't worry about rotavirus here because right. of Paul. And, and so we say, we say they don't exist because we don't see them. But we don't see them and we don't see measles because the vaccines are, are keeping us from seeing them and keeping us not just, and then there's a whole. So, so there's an attitude that's developed yeah. of vaccines being optional. Yeah. Right, that, that's what's happened. I, I, do and, any of us yeah. say we don't want to have, a, who need a hip replacement, that we don't want to have surgery for that? Mm -hmm. Or if you need a bypass and you're going to have a, you know, does anybody say, oh no, I, I won't take that, be, I'd rather, you know, put up with the consequences of the heart attack? I, I don't think so. So, you know, that's kind of what's happened. We're so successful that even this uh, 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 very small deliveries, we have oral delivered vaccines mm -hmm. as well, but I mean, just to take it to needle is a pretty um, small consequence, actually. I mean, there are a lot of new technologies yeah. being developed, but mm -hmm. they're really more about, not so much about user preference, it's more about immunology. So right. there are microneedle patches that are right. being developed. There's um, electroporation, which Dave is quite familiar with, to give through the skin. There's oral vaccines, as we mentioned. Um, but I think that has more to do with trying to get a better immune response. Mm -hmm. And actually, this idea of fear of needles, or, I mean, that's very culturally specific. So it really varies if you go around the uh, country. Many people see vaccines as truly life-saving, which they are. So many of the places where we work, that vaccines are highly admired mm -hmm. and um, people, you know, there's a strong desire to get your child vaccinated. I mean, you see the health systems in many African countries are really populated mainly by women and their children and they know they, they want to get their children vaccinated. So the needle is is not an issue, but you know, not to discount your fear and everyone else's other people's fear. Look, I get them anyway, but it's just <laughs> not fun. I mean, yeah. if you could yeah. make it fun. Yeah, yeah but you know, <laughs> 
when it does get really, uh, if you want to speak about fun, I find what's really fun is coming to work and seeing the young bioengineers right. that work with us who are looking at bioengineering to deliver the antigen and the vaccine components to the right part of the immune system, to deliver the payload, let's say. And uh, that's the approach that they take. So vaccinology and science, it also includes bioengineers now. So we can make sure that the medicine, the vaccine, gets to the right place at the right time to deliver the right effect. So it's really exciting. You know, guys, well, I, I talked to one of your colleagues, Luke DeBron of GSK, and I don't know his exact title, but he's sort of the head of, of, of global research. The big I boss. Think. Yeah, big boss. So Luke DeBron is very interesting. And he said, look, we have a global problem um, that we have viruses, we have things that are going to come back, and we have incredible capacity to now genetically decode what comes at us and to rather rapidly respond in a much faster way on emerging viruses than we ever had before. But it's not in the economic interests of our firm or other firms to just sort of have that available. And we need 200 doctors from around the world in a place ready and constantly working on this as we, as we you know, see more and more genetic advancements, as we see uh, the ability to kind of construct a response uh, on the genetic front, and we need nations to pay for that and, and, and to come in. And, and, and he was very, very passionate about, about saying that the world and, and humanity needs this facility uh, out there, wherever it may be, um, and was critical of the United States that the U.S. has been slow to jump into this and, and, and to participate. And I'm wondering if, if you look at those, I, mean, I, I, I have to tell you of all the times that I've had similar discussions, I've never seen someone so passionate about the need for an international body of this sort that, that dealt with this, that brought science and that continued to make science an even, evenly uh, performing process, not just something that, mm -hmm. that, that was happening reactively and impulsively as things right. came along. Where are you in that? Well, what uh, Luke is getting at, and I, I know Bruce Gellin is here, Bruce has been focused in on this area, has to have others, is that we, as a community, we've been extremely f wonderful in responding to crises. Mm -hmm. So when Ebola hit, everything stopped in the company, and we pulled all of our resources to developing vaccines for Ebola. Same thing during the, uh, H, uh, the H1N1 uh, pandemic of 2009. Uh, Zika as well, and starting and stopping is a very disruptive process to, to, to any group, be it industry or academia or, or government. And so what we would like to do, and the world is starting to move in this direction, is have a dedicated group of scientists across all disciplines, uh, manufacturing, regulatory, science uh, development, who are going to be completely dedicated to developing areas where the scientific community says this is where we need to focus. And so you can't get pulled to, okay, I'm sorry, drop that work, you now need to work here. But rather, you're focused in on these areas that are not going to have the economic yield that traditionally would be there, but it's critically important for public health. And so what Luke is getting at is to have dedicated groups of scientists across all disciplines who can be dedicated to working on emerging infections mm -hmm. or areas where the scientific community feels it's important to develop a vaccine where there may not be the traditional commercial uh, 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 calculation. And right. then if you have that group of people, they're going to deliver because they're not going to get pulled right. to some other project. So before I go to the audience, D Dave and Fran, just real quickly on this, you know, my, my question to Luke, were, were he here, is does that not already exist in the existing ecosystem of researchers and scientists that are communicating, the conferences that are going on? So is this an illusion that, that we don't have it? I'm just interested in just real quick for him, do you think that this is a false notion that, that in fact that the ecosystem of, of research is, is pretty good right now? Dave? I think the, it's a complex question, I think that, um, what we definitely don't have, uh, if you move a little away from the bench, is we, we tee a lot of these up. Outbreak happens. The companies get together with the researchers who are focused in that area. Mm -hmm. They develop something, or in the case of Ebola, both of the vaccines, the first two that went to the clinic were around for almost 15 to 20 years and had mm -hmm. not been moved forward. There was a different innovation there, actually. The ring vaccination was very clever mm -hmm. in trials, if you could talk about that. But, and then um, we put them in place, and then public health measures, which are also critical in these situations, also kick in, and mm. frequently the pandemic starts to get under control. Um, and uh, you know, 
in the presence or uh, before some of the vaccines get deployed, and then there's no interest. Right. There's no interest at that point. And, and so you wind up with a situation where you have a pharma company that's taken some other products offline, which cost them money, which certainly their shareholders don't like and don't encourage, and then you now have this thing that nobody wants to take forward. So that's really a valley of death for all of these, and um, I know we'll mm -hmm. probably hear about that, but CEPI is gonna fund through so-called that and move a couple of products in these different really clear areas we need mm -hmm. so that we will have them ready to go um, and in some stockpiled event, some, some collection, so that uh, if an outbreak happens, uh, we would have that clearly right. there's a need. So that's a combination of sort of developmental scientists and... Um, um, right. and, and, and Thank uh, you. Uh, Fran, Fran, quick thought? Well, I mean, what you described is basically what IAVI has been that's doing right. for about, is one about of 20 the years. Of this. Mm. Yeah, so for HIV, I mean, there was a gap. We realized there was a need for sort of a quick, efficient, So you are nimble. the market response. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, mar and, the, mar the response to the market failure. Well, yeah, it tries to fill the gap and, and, and make a model that will work for other mm. large developers to get involved. But I think that um, we haven't been as good, definitely, with uh, other diseases, and, mm. and these, the recent outbreaks have really highlighted that. And so I think the CEPI organization that David mentioned, um, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness <coughs> Innovations, is, gonna, is a good uh, response Great. to that. Great. We've got time for a couple of questions, comments. Yes, right here in the back. We're going to bring you a microphone, and she's going to hold the microphone. I wish I'd give, give it to you, I but I... Uh, I'm Rui Chow uh, yeah. from the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science right. in the University of Sciences. Um, the question that I have is with regard to the public perception of new vaccine development. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd like to cite the debunked theory of connection between the MMR and autism. Unfortunately, that was years ago when it was debunked, but even recently, in September, there was a paper published um, in the Journal of Inorganic Biochemistry. Right, We're gonna, I'm gonna ask you for short form. Very short, got, yeah. linking the presence of aluminum with uh, brain lesions that resembles autism. Unfortunately, that paper was found to be fraudulent. Mm. Now, how, does the, how do this, uh, the people of the panel can address this in terms of the science, in other words, of the new... Um, Thank you. Perception. So quick form responses well, on that. Well, you know, I think we need to look at the science, actually, of vaccine safety, and Len referred to this, and there's incredible amount of um, peer-reviewed publications and decades of data on uh, infants that have been vaccinated with a number of vaccines, and the adult vaccination data as well, really supports that vaccines are incredibly safe, mm. incredibly safe, and so... I think that's a really strong message that we need to give to the people we work with in our communities here in the U.S. and around the world that uh, we need more vaccines and they are safe. Just as we, as we close, I want to ask um, Len and, and, and Dave one final moment because we were talking in the green room about how the production of vaccines is changing and we're going, and I use my own language, it sounded like you when you were talking, we're going from giant, giant Budweiser scale beer vats to uh, 3D printing uh, in your living room, that, that the production is changing and shifting. Is that already happening in your world? Are you beginning to see the capacity to generate um, responses that, it, that is just being shrunk down? Well, sort of the physical size of production? Well, I, I don't think we have any licensed products that way right now, mm -hmm. but we have technologies, as Len and I were talking about, nucleic acid technologies that uh, require much simpler and uh, basically could be reduced, it's chemistry to immunology. Right. And that is uh, scalable and the rest of the issues you brought Len, up. Len, you were very graphic about it. Well, it, it's absolutely fascinating to think that in the future, instead of having a factory that's the size of the Kimmel Center, we can have a factory that's the size of the little green room back there. Mm -hmm. um, with plug and play technologies where you can be switching out uh, the genetic material to make right. a vaccine against, but where we are is that the science is advanced but the regulatory process has, has not kept up. Right. So this is, um, hasn't completely gotten to live yet. We need to have the regulatory affairs side and the, the ability to license the vaccine to catch up with the science right. here so we can deliver on that promise. Well, I'm gonna end it there. I wanna thank Len Friedland uh, with GSK, Francis Pretty with uh, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, and David Weiner with Wistar. Thank you all very, very much.
for a session produced by our underwriter. Please welcome Ruxandra Drogia, Vice President of Public Health and Scientific Affairs at Merck. Rahul Isteriz, Vice President and Head of the North America Region of Pfizer Vaccines Medical. And here to lead the conversation is Kirsten Thistle, Partner at Health Impact Strategies. Good morning. Good morning. We were just back in the green room having a love fest on vaccines. Um, we all share, I think, a, a great love of working in this space. And, um, you know, I think obviously the holy grail is to prevent a disease. Preventing it um, really is, you know, as good as it gets in terms of health care. So, and Raul has um, <coughs> practiced both in Venezuela and in the U.S. And I had an interesting story about sort of what inspires him to, um, to work in vaccines and just sort of the juxtaposition of working in um, in Venezuela versus the United States. So I, I thought it'd be good for you to share that story. Sure. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. So uh, my story is uh, a simple one. Uh, I am new to vaccines, uh, and I am new to the pharmaceutical industry. I'm just a physician, and I graduated from medical school in Venezuela, and there I saw many vaccine-preventable diseases. I saw diphtheria, tetanus, mumps, measles, rubella. I saw everything. After I graduated, I came to the US. I came to Connecticut, to New Haven. And there, I practiced for a few years doing my internship, residency, and fellowship. And I didn't see those diseases. I came back to my country after seven years in New Haven and then I saw them again. So I became convinced that vaccine-preventable diseases, A, are preventable, and B, need to be prevented by us. So that's how I am so convinced about the value of vaccination. Yeah, so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, advancing a new era in vaccines, and um, hopefully everybody's had a chance to see the report that was on your chair on all the vaccines in development. Um, there are 264 candidates in the pipeline, you know, a huge number. Obviously, all of them won't make it to the finish line, but I thought it'd be helpful, Roxandra, if you could just break down for us what that 264 looks like. So thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here today. Um, and to your question, uh, probably uh, everyone is imagining that those vaccines uh, are actually targeting infectious diseases. Uh, in fact, um, it is a bit of a misconception. A lot of, of work is ongoing in uh, the area of oncology, uh, but also things like Alzheimer, allergy, um, other types of indications. And, and if you're looking at the infectious disease, we do have in development both therapeutic vaccines and preventing vaccines, uh, looking at, at pathogens who were probably our enemies for many, many years, like uh, HIV, uh, areas where we need to develop better vaccines, like tuberculosis, a lot of work uh, on um, influenza, uh, in particular um, strains that might have a pandemic potential, uh, and then of course uh, the emerging epidemics, uh, the diseases that uh, are recurrent, uh, but they do actually create a, a lot of damage when they are recurring, such as uh, Ebola uh, and uh, other types of encephalitis. So uh, while the number seems very big, uh, in fact, the indications uh, are extremely diverse, and the approaches to solving these issues uh, are equally diverse. So, Raul, can you, you know, I was reading um, recently that the dengue vaccine took um, 20 years and $1.5 billion to bring it to the finish line. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what goes into actually, you know, sort of idea to arm, what goes into that process of both developing and bringing a vaccine to market? Sure. So I, I headed the uh, medical part of the DMC for the Sanofi Dengue vaccine, so I have some experience in it. It was a fabulous development, uh, and as you said, took a long time and, and many, many US dollars. So it, it all starts with an unmet medical need. When there is a need for a vaccine, then there's the uh, idea that we need to make a vaccine. 
immediately after that, when the need is defined and measured and is, continues to be unmet, then there's a process of discovery. And this is an intellectual and laboratory process which uh, also takes uh, years where you make a vaccine candidate. You use knowledge of chemistry, you use knowledge of immunology, pharmacology, and you integrate all of those and you make a vaccine that is potentially going to be used in the future. Once you have that product that you really believe is going to be safe and is going to produce some kind of an immunological response that will be useful to prevent the disease or to prevent colonization or whatever, then you go to testing of that product. And the testing has essentially two areas. One is in animals. That's called preclinical testing. That also takes some time and effort. Uh, and is done with very strict rules of uh, uh, good laboratory practices. And then the second absolutely fascinating uh, part of this testing, which is the testing in human beings. Testing in human beings takes a long time, takes a lot of effort, takes some risk. That you, you will understand that there are many, 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 uh, not only scientific, but also ethical and practical questions that need to be answered during that period of testing in, 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 in humans. The testing in humans is, is, is complex. It has three or four phases. The, the, the first phase is based on uh, safety. Safety is paramount to any vaccine. The second, and this, it takes a few patients or a few individuals. The phase two is the proof of concept. There is where you see whether the vaccine not only continues to be safe in a larger number of individuals, but also now produces a response that you think may predict prevention of the disease you're targeting. Then comes the larger pivotal trials that, uh, that uh, make sure that the uh, numbers that you got in the first two phases are really replicated in a larger number of patients. And sometimes you need uh, phase four uh, immediately after marketing or around marketing that uh, target safety, efficacy, and long-term um, uh, efficacy and safety. Uh, then you have to manufacture the vaccine. And to manufacture the vaccine, this is a painstaking process, a, an extraordinarily delicate process. And at the end of this process, you have a product that is of very high quality. And those are the kinds of vaccines that we are enjoying uh, right now. So I, um, I wanted to get into adult immunizations briefly. Um, I think there was a session earlier this week in Washington on adult immunization rates and why we're failing to hit the uh, Healthy People 2020 targets. So we only have a couple minutes left, but I think um, it would be insightful to hear your thoughts on really how we take advantage of these. I mean, to me, it's a function of like, do you want to get sick or do you not want to get sick? But I don't think that um, people necessarily see it that way. And I think, you know, we have these great tools to keep people healthy and we're really not taking full advantage of them. Um, at the, really at the teen and the adult level. So in, you know, just a, a minute or so, if you could share both your thoughts on really how we can get folks to embrace these, um, these vaccines better. Roxandra, you wanna start? So vaccines together with clean water, access to clean water and some of the hygiene measures uh, are the interventions that added 30 years to our lifetime and a lot of well-being. think polio. So, thinking that we have been rather successful, at least in some parts of the world, with um, pediatric vaccination, and thinking at what is the cost of actually treating diseases versus preventing them, mm -hmm. and really being able to communicate that in a comprehensive, but also in a simple manner uh, to the public, I think would make great strides. Well, further thoughts? And 30 seconds or less. I fully agree with <laughs> Roxandra. <laughs> um, okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I look forward to the rest of the session talking more about vaccines. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Next up, the case for global public health. Please welcome Bruce Gellin, the president of global immunization at the Sabin Vaccine Institute. Penny Heaton, the CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Medical Research Institute. Ted Schenkelberg, Chief Operating Officer of the Human Vaccines Project, and here to lead the conversation is Olga Kazan, who writes about all things health for The Atlantic. Okay, so we're here to talk about the crucial role of vaccines in global public health, and I'm here with three people who approach that uh, from all different angles, so we're going to get a kind of a 360 view of that. Um, so I'd like to just kick things off with sort of how far we've come and, and sort of get a sense of what have the successes been so far. So kind of from each of your vantage points, what have we accomplished with vaccines? What does the world not have to worry about anymore thanks to this amazing innovation? Well, let, let, me, let me start. And I think part of this is the way, and, and I think you've, got, you've gotten a feel for this from the earlier panels, that there's a, a vaccination world and a, vac a, a vaccine world and a vaccination world. And there's not necessarily a line that connects them. So maybe I'll talk about the vaccination part of it, because okay. at the Sabin Vaccine Institute, we're focused largely on improving access to, to vaccines and how we can help strengthen systems to do that and some of the knowledge and innovation to get there. So at the vaccination end, I mean, what I hopefully everybody knows is that you don't have to worry about smallpox. That has been a disease that's been eradicated, and we can talk some more about polio, which is on the cusp of that. But overall, having getting vaccines to the people who need them most has made huge differences globally. In the United States, it's also made such a difference that people growing up now don't know any of these diseases they're being vaccinated about. So the strengthening systems that get vaccines to the people has had a huge impact. And maybe you want to talk about the science and the vaccine part of it, because those are hand in hand. You can't have vaccination without vaccine. And just having vaccine doesn't mean it's going to get to where it needs to go. And absolutely. And you know, when you think about just vaccines, as, as Mr. Gates says, he says, they're like magic. <coughs> and they really are. I mean, we eradicated smallpox from the face of the earth using vaccines. At polio, we have had only 13 cases this year, so fewer cases than ever before in two countries. That's down from 355,000 cases in 125 countries in 1988. So look where we are, and next year will probably be the last year that we'll see wild-type polio in the face of the earth, and that's because of oral polio vaccine. It's just been amazing. Measles deaths are down by 75%, mm. uh, which is just phenomenal. But unfortunately, there's still one in five children globally that aren't getting the vaccines that they, that they need. There's still 1.5 million deaths every year from vaccine-preventable diseases, and that's what we have to fix. It's the vaccination problem is why those 1.5 million deaths are still occurring. So we need to make sure that there's good delivery systems and strong infrastructure so that the vaccines that are being developed by the wonderful scientists he's going to talk about are actually reaching the people who need them. So, you know, from our perspective, uh, we say that vaccines beyond clean water are probably the most important health intervention we've had. Tens of millions of lives have been saved. Many of us are here because we've been vaccinated or someone before us has been vaccinated. When we look forward to the future, um, we think that we can do even more, that this was just the start. And so vaccines against HIV and malaria, I think, are possible. Um, tuberculosis. If we look into the non-communicable diseases and we start to understand how the immune system works, where I start to able to unravel it and figure out how the immune system fights disease, we start to look at things like cancer, perhaps even regulating autoimmunity or other areas. We look at pandemics like uh, influenza or Ebola. If we had effective vaccines for that, we think that this, these successes were just the start. And over the next 50 years, we could have broad advances across many different areas of health. And what is the role of the US in, in kind of securing vaccines globally or, or vaccination from, from either side? So in my past role at the Department of Health and Human Services uh, at the National Vaccine Program Office, I had a window into that. And I think there are two parts to that, to that answer. One part is the U.S. role in supporting global immunization broadly uh, and participating in, country, in countries doing that, also participating with, the, with, with Gavi, the Global Alliance. And the other is on a technical, on a technical basis. Uh, from a Health and Human, Department of Health and Human Service perspective, every agency within that has a strong global health component. So it's the CDC, you see them as the disease fighters uh, at, when there's an outbreak. 
But you, what you don't see so much is, is the FDA helping countries develop their own regulatory authorities, the NIH doing research in the field. So virtually all the parts of what I was familiar with, with at the Department of Health and Human Services had this technical input, which is separate from uh, a financial support of a, of, a, of a system like Gavi. Right. And, and, so, and so what about the CEPI? I mean, we have this new innovation uh, for securing vaccines globally called CEPI. Uh, how did that come about, and, and what is that aiming to do or doing already? Yeah. So <laughs> CEPI, for those of you who don't know, is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. And it really uh, came out of the Ebola crisis that we had. Uh, as we know, there were a lot of lessons that we learned from the Ebola crisis. Uh, one is this important, the importance of the infrastructure, making sure you've got good systems to detect disease early and to prevent it. You've got good immunization systems, which add to that infrastructure. Uh, so we recognized that, but we also recognized that if you don't have that good infrastructure, then you need vaccines. You need vaccine stockpiled. You need rapid response platforms. Forms uh, to control those outbreaks and to prevent them be from becoming humanitarian crises. So CEPI was formed to actually provide the vaccine response uh, to outbreaks. And so they are working on diseases that have a high probability of causing outbreaks and that could cause global crises in the future. Uh, they're funding partners around the world to make vaccines against those diseases. The idea is those vaccines would be stockpiled so that we'd be ready for use if an outbreak occurs. They're also working on what we call rapid response platforms. So they are funding uh, innovators in the US and elsewhere uh, to develop technologies like nucleic acid vaccines, RNA, DNA vaccines, uh, that uh, when, a, when an unknown pathogen emerges, you can use these uh, technologies to rapidly make a vaccine that's genetically matched to that new pathogen and get it distributed and uh, with the first vaccine being available in just a few weeks. Oh, wow. You know, are we where we need to be? No, but are we making a lot of progress? Yes, and, and, and CEPI is just one piece of that puzzle that's going on around the world. Well, so, let, me just, let me just add to that yeah. because mm -hmm. of what CEPI is not. And, and, it's, mm -hmm. and, and I think it's important because because CEPI is not, we just heard about HIV, CEPI is not TB, yeah. and CEPI is not influenza, because when they scan mm -hmm. that space, they, there were other places working for that. So I think it's important when you start looking at CEPI as, mm -hmm. as the disease they're going after, that, that because they're not including those mm -hmm. three doesn't mean they're not important. I mean, and Ted and I were just talking about, uh, about influenza. We have an influenza vaccine that needs to be better, and we need to have a vaccine that we, that's going to be broader protective. So there's, there's a science component to that. But the point is that CEPI has carved out a niche of trying to identify mm -hmm. those diseases that could take off and be more ready from a vaccine standpoint. But there are, there, there are other diseases that are on the CEPI list which are equally or more important. So how would something like that change the trajectory of, of like the Ebola outbreak that we just saw in 2014? So when you look at um, the, the epidemic curves and the, and the cases and the number of deaths that we're accumulating, we've done a lot of modeling to look at, well, what would have happened if we had a vaccine available you know, at you know, the six-month point, the five-month point, the four-month point, the three-month point? And it's phenomenal what, how many lives could have been saved. If you translate that to say, what if we had a flu pandemic? Uh, like the 1918 flu. When we did modeling to look at that, I mean, literally every week saves thousands and thousands of lives. Mm -hmm. So these rapid response platforms are really important. One of the reasons, though, why the foundation is uh, supporting CEPI, the Gates Foundation is supporting CEPI, another reason is because these same rapid response platforms can be utilized for vaccines against diseases of the poorest and diseases that we haven't conquered yet, right. like HIV, like malaria, like TB. So that's, that will be what we're hoping is a spillover effect, if you will. And while they're working on these niche diseases, the learnings from that are going to then be able to be applied to these other diseases of the poorest. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of the flu, Ted, do you want to tell us a little bit about the, the influenza mm -hmm. project and kind of why a, a new or, or new types of flu vaccines are important? Sure. So um, I worked with the Human Vaccines Project last week. Um, we launched something called the Universal Influenza Vaccine Initiative. And when we talked to scientists across the field and we looked at the field, um, you know, there's a concern that the current flu vaccines aren't as good as they should be. We have to get vaccinated every year. They don't work in everyone. <laughs> They particularly don't work in the people who are most vulnerable, the elderly and the young, um, people in the developing world. And 
the vaccines often don't cover pandemic strains. And as Penny was saying, every 25 years or so, we have these outbreaks, these pandemic outbreaks. And should we have something on the scale of 1918, which killed 50 to 100 million people in a time we didn't have jet planes, in a time we didn't have mass migration, it could be really, really devastating to global health. And so the need for a vaccine is clear there. And one of the main things that we focus on is understanding how to generate human immune responses effectively for all people across all strains. This is a tall scientific order, um, but we do know that some people are protected, and we do know that the, the immune system does have uh, strong immune responses against influenza, and the trick is getting that to be broader and broader across populations so across you, flu strains. Could yeah. you clarify, because I think a lot of people here, they maybe went to CVS and got a sure. flu, flu shot. So how is, how is this different? So the flu is an incredibly varied virus, and we have to predict every year which one comes out. But we only hit a certain number of strains uh, that have circulated or that may be circulating in a particular year. We want to expand it so that anything that's under that rubric of what is flu, can be, we can protect for. Oh. And that's seasonal strains and pandemic strains. I think the, the subtext, though, and, and the, you heard this in the earlier panels, is that the, quote, easy vaccines have been made. The hard ones where we have to do better than Mother Nature. You have to do better than natural immunity. That's clearly the case with some of these uh, iconic diseases, HIV, TB, malaria, and flu, because we need, to, we need to understand how to do that. So it's not just matching the strains, but can't we get longer protection than a year? We know that, that many vaccines we have can give you, like measles, can give you a lifelong protection. Understanding why that is, or understanding why it is that some people don't get that is, is critical science, the kind of stuff that the, that, the, that the upstream immunology community is working on. And building on the huge amount of investments in that science, I think there's going to have payoffs that we really can't even guess how they're going to play out. So I want to dig in a little bit into what that work looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. Can you guys talk about kind of your, you know, a couple of the of the diseases that you've worked on, maybe typhoid in your case and, and malaria and TB in yours? Mm -hmm. Well, let me start with, with typhoid. So there, there are a number of, of, of global immunization programs at the Sabin Vaccine Institute that we, we house something called the Coalition Against Typhoid. And it's really all the players who have some stake in that, including the, the science community, the vaccine delivery community, and the water and sanitation community as well. I think that why typhoid is, uh, is, is, is so important is that it's the iconic disease of the poor. If you have water and sanitation, you don't have typhoid. And you can watch societies that have that infrastructure development and typhoid goes away. So now, and particularly from Mr. Gates' perspective of looking at the, uh, the disease of the poor who shouldn't necessarily suffer from that, on top of that, we have the problem of antibiotic resistance. And over the past 15 years, uh, these, the typhoid strains are becoming increasingly resistant to antibiotics. And now you have this worst case scenario of the iconic disease of the poor that's creeping towards being untreatable. There's a new vaccine that was just discussed at the, at the World Health Organization a few weeks ago that I think is going to make some huge inroads into that. But again, that's, that's one of many Sabin programs is trying to think about how we raise awareness and improve access to a vaccine like the typhoid vaccine. And at the Bill and Melinda Gates Medical Research Institute, we're focused on malaria, tuberculosis, and uh, enteric diseases. Uh, and you can kind of think of it, it's new, it's still in its infancy, but you can think of it as a nonprofit biotech. Mm -hmm. And we believe that all lives have equal value and that everyone deserves the right to have um, a healthy and productive life. And so the concept, this new institute, is that we will take the latest technology, the learnings from the HIV field, the learnings from the immuno-oncology field, the learnings from uh, the orphan diseases and, and gene therapy fields, and we will take and apply all of that knowledge to these diseases of the poorest and try to find solutions for malaria, uh, for TB, and for other enteric diseases beyond rotavirus. These diseases together are killing four people every minute. It's, it's crazy. It's just um, uh, mind-boggling. And so to be able to have the opportunity to actually apply the latest technologies to these diseases and to move forward uh, with finding solutions, new vaccines, et cetera, to reach our goals are, are really important. And it's an incredible opportunity. We're getting started on it, still in its infancy, uh, but uh, we're really excited about the potential uh, for um, reaching our goals, eradicating malaria, ending diarrheal disease deaths, and uh, bending that TB epidemic curve. 
So I want to talk a little bit about the, the vaccination component and actually, you know, getting those vaccines into people who mm -hmm. need them. Um, Bruce, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about herd immunity, how it works, and, and why it's so important, and, and where that might be in jeopardy today. So again, the, the concept, and it's, I, I think that when you think about community immunity, that's what it's about, and how vaccines, how vaccines really facilitate that. What's unique about vaccines is that they, they prevent disease in individuals and communities at large. And actually, they actually the, the, that's important because not no, no vaccine is 100%. So even if you've been vaccinated, you still may be susceptible, but the reason you don't get, you don't get these diseases is because the, 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 the population at large has been, has been immunized. If you're a virus and everybody in the community has been, been immunized, you have a hard time finding a place to go. So that's where that's really what the concept is about. I think, and you're going to you're going to hear about measles soon. But measles is, is probably the indicator disease. It is the most infectious disease that we know. Wow. If in a susceptible population, up to 18 people will be infected by one person with measles. So look at how that will explode. And so maybe the good the upside of the story of these small outbreaks is how much of the population is immune, so that these sparks don't become forest fires. Mm -hmm. Well, just to add and give a really concrete example of herd immunity, you know, I worked on rotavirus vaccines at the beginning of my career, and there's a report that came out a couple of years ago that said the herd immunity with rotavirus is beyond what we ever expected. So, uh, you know, rotavirus vaccine is given to little kids at age two, four, six months. The protection from that vaccine goes all the way to age 44 years. The CDC has shown that there's a reduction in hospitalization for diarrheal diseases not just in the year old kids or the toddlers, but all the way up through age 44. So with that herd immunity effect, you're actually protecting uh, the parents of the children uh, and, and their siblings. People uh, who haven't so, been vaccinated. Yes, yeah. people who haven't been vaccinated. Yeah, and so um, that's just one example of the amazing impact of herd immunity. And then there are people in the community who yeah. can't be, who have uh, a, contra a medical mm -hmm. contraindication, they may have an immune system issue of treat being treated for cancer, and those people can't be vaccinated for some vaccines. So the more people around them who are vaccinated, the less likely they're going to be found by that, by that virus. Right. And, you know, and it's interesting because at, at the same time we're at this moment nationally where, uh, you know, it, in, some, uh, in some communities people are kind of turning inward. So something I hear when I'm out reporting is that, well, we can support global health after we've fixed all of our problems here in America. You know, we have our own health problems and we have homelessness and, and whatnot. Can you guys talk about the how national security and how um, America's public health is connected to global public health and why it's important to uh, prevent these diseases at, at the site where they happen? Well, let me just take one step back because a, a little over 10 years ago, the World Health Organization issued something called the International Health Regulations. And it was really the recognition that diseases anywhere could be diseases everywhere, and the importance of surveillance, the importance of reporting, so that you could try to get ahead of things before they took off. Now, my analogy before was a spark in a forest fire. You want, you want to go after things when they're sparks and not, when they're, not when, they're, when they're raging. So that has now been in place for 10 years. I think all the countries in the, in the world have signed up for that. There are now evaluations of, of various of programs. People externally come in and evaluate programs. We have that in the United States to see where there are still things that need to be improved. So I think the point is that th this is something that all countries are looking at, and, and, and an issue anywhere could be an issue everywhere. So a, a secure, a, an outbreak anywhere, and that's why we're so worried about Ebola, could rapidly be that outbreak everywhere. So I think the interchange between, the interlocking between national security here, national security elsewhere, and global health security is one, is one puzzle. And just, you know, if you bring it back to influenza back in 1918, we didn't have much international trade, we didn't have airplanes. Within less than a year, 30% of the global population was infected. If we had a similar virus like that today, it would be catastrophic, not just from a health perspective, from an economic perspective, a social perspective, and a security perspective. We're interconnected. These diseases don't respect boundaries, and they move very fast, and we can't control that. So we need to respond mm -hmm. with science measures and health measures and structural measures against these things. I was wondering if you guys have any um, kind of learnings from, from the field or from times that you visited um, the countries that are affected by some of these diseases, especially poorer countries. What is everyday life like when, you know, something like malaria or TB is a, is a constant threat for you? Yeah. 
So, you know, in my work at, uh, with the Centers for Disease Control and then at the Gates Foundation, I'm often in low-income countries. And, um, you know, I've seen those diseases that uh, we don't see any longer here. You know, I've seen neonatal tetanus. I've seen hip meningitis. I've seen, uh, you know, deaths from uh, measles, et cetera. And, and one um, uh, experience that I had in particular, I remember, I was at CDC doing a study looking at diarrheal disease in infants born to HIV-infected mothers. And uh, I would go on rounds, hospital rounds, with the local pediatrician every morning. And so I went into um, a um, room. We went into a room. Now, this hospital, you know, it's concrete block. This particular part of the hospital had no electricity. There was a window with the sun coming through and then, you know, a crib with a little girl in the crib uh, lined up along the wall. She was about three years old. And I went in, and she was very, very ill. I, all my pediatric instincts immediately kicked in. Her respiratory rate was 90, and that normally a child of that age would have a respiratory rate of about 20. And so I was like, we've got to take her to the intensive care unit. We've got to get her on a ventilator. But of course, none of that was available. And as I stood there in that room for the next 10 minutes, that child's respiratory rate dropped to 60 and to 40 and to 20 and then to nothing. And she, and she died right then and there. And, and the, the pediatrician, the local pediatrician, was actually talking to the mother and saying, you know, um, looking at her and, say, and, 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 and almost yelling at her, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then I realized this child had the rash of measles. She had measles pneumonitis, and that's why she died. And the pediatrician was asking the mother why she didn't get the child vaccinated. Well, the mother, in fact, when that child was one year of age, had walked 12 miles to get her child's vaccine for measles. And when she got to the clinic, there was no vaccine because robbers had broken into the clinic and stolen all of it. It gets back to that vaccination point. There's so many steps along the way that are problematic. So these are the, you know, these are the things that we, that, that, you know, people in low income countries are going through. And we just, you know, we forget here in the US how, how good we have it because vaccines have been so successful. We don't see these diseases anymore. Uh, but in fact, you know, uh, mothers in low-income countries will walk for miles and miles to have their children vaccinated. Well, yeah. well, in a second, I'm going to take questions from the audience. But can you kind of, uh, you know, highlight some of the things that could could help, you know, prevent things like that from happening in the future? Like, what could in the future, what could help um, children like that actually survive? Yeah. So I mean, I think there's several things, and actually, this is something that the Sabin Institute works on. Uh, really thinking about, okay, first of all, we have to make sure vaccines are available at, a, at an affordable price and in the right profile, the right characteristics so that they're easy to give in low-income countries. So that's something we really think about and at the uh, Gates Foundation, at the Institute. It's what are the characteristics of that vaccine that we should be thinking about when we're first developing it so that it can be easier to deliver down the road? Uh, so that's one really important piece. You know, How can we make it more affordable? How can we make it easier to give? And then the other pieces of it really gets to the vaccination delivery system and how can we improve those? And, and Bruce, you may want to comment further on that so that we can prevent these, these diseases. And these well, in fact, it gets, it, uh, so yeah. that's right, because mm -hmm. it's, it's the ability to manage a program and to make sure that the vaccine gets to where it needs to go and all the pieces about that, that the, that the refrigeration equipment is working and in place so the vaccine doesn't fall out of, the, mm -hmm. out of that system over time. And it gets down to that clinic and that the people, there's, a, there's a, an appreciation by the people providing the vaccine of what these people have gone through to get there. Um, there, there is, I think, equally the part about making sure that not only the, the programs are stable, but it actually gets back to this, uh, the concern about the response in a pandemic. It's these everyday systems that, are, that we're going to call on when there's a big problem. And if these systems aren't working now, when CEPI delivers some great vaccine, unless there's a system to deliver it, it's going to sit at a loading dock. Hmm. Wow. Or have there been any technological innovations that have made any of this easier? I mean, we've, we've seen so much in just the last few years with drones and, and all sorts of other things being deployed to developing countries. Has any of that helped with this? Yeah, I think it's still early days yet. Yeah. Certainly looking at drones to deliver medical supplies is something that uh, is being done and that we're, we're very interested in. We're also looking at new delivery devices. Yeah. Uh, so for example, for measles, we're really focused on trying to develop a measles patch. Okay. So it'd be like a little patch with micro needles that you could put on the, on the child's armor on their back 
and uh, and the beetles just dissolve in like two to three minutes. And so, I mean, those are hard to manufacture, they're hard to stabilize, but we're doing more and more work and things in, in that area. So looking at, another thing we're looking at is, you know, vaccine where you would give a single shot, and but it would be slowly released over time so the children wouldn't have to come back to the clinic uh, for, their, for their subsequent boosters. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of that work going on. Uh, you know, I still think we're 10 to 15 years away from it, but I think we will get there. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely a little easier to give a patch to a little baby, right, than a, than a, a shot. shot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, do you guys have any questions? Questions? No questions. We can see the bubbles of your head. So you know <laughs> yeah. what the questions are. Okay, well, why don't we talk a little more? What are some of the, the kind of uh, the scientific um, challenges that, that are, you know, we've talked a little bit about delivery and, and some of the um, kind of hurdles along the way, you, robbers, for example. But, but when you look at the science, like, why is it so difficult to make new vaccines? So, you know, I think. As Bruce was saying before, uh, many of the quote unquote easy vaccines have done. These are against um, viruses or pathogens that are not that complicated genetically. And things like HIV or tuberculosis are really complex um, organisms. And we, what we're doing now, and many scientists are doing now, is focusing on the system that prevents and fights disease, which is the immune system instead of, instead of the virus. And we're trying to figure out there must be some rules and some common way the body works to fight disease. And if those can be unraveled, and we now have the technologies and genomics and bioinformatics to do that, we can figure out the blueprint or the key to how the body fights disease and use that to make better vaccines against these really, really complicated targets. So is it, is it personalized then, or is it kind of? Some of it could be personalized, yeah. but in vaccination, you're mostly interested in generalized. You want to protect as many people as possible across a, a broad a swath of geography as you can. And so we, you really want to get down to the core rules of how the immune system fights disease, the core rules of, of, of immunity, basically, and figure out what those are to be able to engineer the vaccines in the future against the really, really, really difficult targets. And on the personalized part, it's trying to understand what is it about that subset of people who don't have an immune response for a vaccine versus those who do. So there's little, little insights into that now, but trying to tease that out, I think, is going to go a long way to understanding immune protection more broadly. Yeah, and part of what we've been doing at the foundation is really looking, say, people with malaria, for example, looking at their antibody response and actually building the phylogenetic tree, understanding at a molecular level what that response is, and then we can take that knowledge and use that to create a vaccine. We call it reverse engineer the vaccine oh, cool. uh, and then move forward with that. So that's part of what we'll be doing at the institute as well. Oh, wow. oh we have a question. Oh, you have to hold it. Okay. So, um, you know, some of the e easy vaccines, uh, polio, smallpox, have been very successful because there is no, uh, no other animal reservoir of it. So you vaccinate the human population and that's it. You've eliminated it. So how can we address the zoonotic reservoirs of infectious disease from which these emerging infectious diseases come? And is there a sort of one health approach that can be utilized for that? I, I think that's, that's, that's a great question. And I think um, the answer is to have a multi-pronged strategy. It really is the one health approach. You know, of course, my background and what I'm working on is malaria. Well, if you think about our goal at the foundation is to eradicate malaria, just like we're eradicating smallpox, or just like we've eradicated smallpox and, and, uh, and the world is, it, it, and the, and the Global Polio Eradication Initiative has eradicated polio or is about to eradicate polio. So um, the um, issue is that you have to have a multi-pronged approach where you're trying to control the vector, the mosquito, as well as prevent uh, disease and transmission uh, from the human. So it involves you know, insecticides, insecticide-treated bed nets, potentially genetically modified mosquitoes, Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes. You've got drugs and vaccines. So I think it's going to take the entire armamentarium to actually eradicate malaria. If you look at other zoonotic diseases that cause outbreaks, you know, the, the hemorrhagic fever viruses, et cetera, I think in those cases, it goes back to what, you know, we've been talking about. We have to have strong infrastructure to detect the outbreaks early and to contain them. And there are some low-income countries who do this amazingly well. I mean, look at Ghana. 
they, uh, they've done an amazing job with controlling these types of outbreaks. So I think it's a mix of both, and we just can't take a single approach, but we have to take a holistic approach to these types of things. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's, it's disease, I think the concept is really the right one, and you have to look at it disease by disease because it plays out differently. And then one place that, that is getting a lot of attention, and I think increasingly the vaccines, or a piece of that is antibiotic resistance, where there's clearly the relationship between the way that humans, humans use antibiotics and the way that animals are, are, are being fed antibiotics. Um, so that's another one where a global health, a uh, one health approach is gonna matter. But it's also a great place for vaccines. If you're gonna prevent these diseases, then you don't have to even think about treating them. As, as, as an adjunct to anti antibiotic stewardship is that the more that people are, gonna, are protected from these diseases, the less antibiotics we have to use. We brought up the, the situation of typhoid. We'll see how this plays out. There's now this new typhoid vaccine that is recommended for places, for parts of the world that have a high typhoid burden and also have a high burden of antibiotic resistance in those strains. And it's a chance to actually see how the, the, um, the, the use of a vaccine in those communities affects that trajectory of antibiotic resistance. Huh. Challenging stuff. Well, thank you so much, Bruce, Penny, and Ted. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you all for being here, too. I appreciate thank it. You. For a case study about the measles outbreak in Minneapolis, please welcome Kristen Arisman, the Director of Infectious Disease Epidemiology, Prevention, and Control at the Department of Health in Minnesota. Sharif Mohammed, an yeah. imam who leads the Islamic Civic Society of America. And welcome back, the Atlantic Steve Clemens. Hey, buddy. So, Kristen, um, I just want to ask you about your dashboard and what your dashboard looked like in April of this year. Uh, I know you're responsible for looking at a lot of questions about public health, um, but in 2016, the United States had, in the entire country, 70 cases of measles. And just sort of overnight in Minneapolis, your, your, your area of jurisdiction had 79 pop up. But what, what, what did your dashboard look like? Um, well, certainly when we heard about the first cases in two young Somali children, um, I was actually in Atlanta when I got the call. and. Um, got an early flight for the next morning and flew back. And my concern was that we did have the potential for a great deal of spread because we knew that um, there had been concerns about vaccines in the Somali population. And we knew that the vaccination rate was 42% uh, for the MMR vaccine. So um, it was a situation in which we kind of had a spark and we knew that we had sort of a tinder box of um, and so you potential. got this hit, you were telling me, on April 10th. Right. And then when we looked into the first <laughs> cases, we discovered that um, these, one of the young boys had a sister who had had measles that had gone undetected with an onset of March 30th. So um, we, we sort of started the outbreak a little bit behind the eight ball because we'd already had spread that we did not know about. When were you all clear? On August 25th. And I know you played a big role in this, which we're going to get to, but, but did you have a party when it was all done? Yes, we all. <laughs> did, we, you, did you drink? No. <laughs> <laughs> we, you, you had great Somali food, I heard. Yeah, yep, so, yep. Yes. So, we so, the very good food. So take yeah. us into this, because it, it is interesting, because you have one of the cases, and we have a debate going on in the country uh, in some places, unfortunately, uh, on on the damage that vaccines might do, the efficacy of vaccines, and you had a kind of a real play thing. I have some data here that show me at, at one point uh, in in uh, Minnesota, Somali children were actually immunized at a rate at 92 percent higher uh, than non-Somali children, but that that level fell from 92 percent in 2004 to 42 percent uh, in 2014. What happened? Um, well. A couple of things happened. There was a, a media production that looked at the proportion of um, children who were utilizing the Minneapolis Public Schools Special Education Program. Mm -hmm. And um, there was concern that there was a disproportionate number of Somali children who were using that service. And so when that came out, um, it really brought attention within the community of concerns about um, autism, and, and those kinds of things. And that was a new concept for many of the parents in the community. So while, you know, 
um, for many of us who grew up in the United States, we were familiar with those terms. For the Somali community, it was something that was new to them. And um, I will say that right from the beginning, when the community was um, grappling with this and trying to understand what was happening, the anti-vaccine groups were very eager to get involved with the community. And so even from the earliest um, meeting that we had, those folks were involved and in, um, reaching out to the community. And I would say um, they reached out in a way that was more effective than we did at the health department. And I'll explain that by saying that initially when these concerns were raised, um, for instance, I, my, the area that I oversee is infectious disease, so I have right. the immunization program. So when I was going to address the issue and my staff, we were providing information about vaccines, um, which seemed like the right logical thing to do. But for the community, that wasn't sufficient. They had concerns about autism, and when we only focused on answers about vaccines, it completely <coughs> missed their concern. And so How soon did you know the mistakes you were making? Um, probably, it, it was a couple of years, so it was after about 2011. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we did was we, we hired Somali staff, and we had staff that were working on outreach related to immunizations, as well as providing information on autism. But what happened in this outbreak, we had been doing that, and um, the culture, the Somali culture, and I should let Sharif say, it's, right. it's an oral culture. Yes. Um, so it's, it's very much about relationships. And so our staff, while they were working on relationships, there, there were two of them, and they, they weren't able to do everything. When we got into the middle of this outbreak, we realized we needed trusted partners um, who were respected in the community. And although I have a certain role in our agency, I'm not the leadership that the community needed to hear. And so it was actually the imams that came to us and said, we can help you, and I'll let Sharif talk about that. I just want to that. note that Sharif is the first uh, Muslim uh, chaplain of the state of Minnesota, which is a cool title in, in, in many ways. But but you 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 saw what was unfolding. What how did how did you decide to get involved in this? Uh, I think I want a little bit also go back. Yes, Somalis we are a oral society, and we spread the information just by oral, by relative, by friends. Mm -hmm. Easy in that way, number one. Number two, as Christian said, when uh, Somalis, when we came, the vaccination rate was very high. But the issue of autism and the child, child uh, development got uh, to the community, and a lot of the parents little bit feel, oh, maybe autism and the vaccination have some kind of link or some kind of linkage. And the group of anti-vaccination used that math, and they used the fear, and the community just to back off. That was one. My portion, I think, when the measles outbreak came, I approached uh, the department, and I think it was several different reasons. Number one, I am a father of six children, who all of them under 18. Mm. And that gives me some kind of compassion toward uh, uh, children. Second piece was, I feel a, a, a responsible toward my God and also my, my community too. And I think another reason was also feel my civic duty to work on, on the common good for the whole state of Minnesota. Mm. And the last piece was, I also, as uh, you said, mm. I was a child in the Fairview uh, system. Therefore, I have some kind of information for the health care and how the health care system is up, up work. Then I approach the department. And the one last piece was, usually when you get this news, you get, oh, another Somali child again, another Somali child. And I feel some kind of shame and concern, both. Therefore, I said, I have to do something. I have to contact it. Then I contact the department. And right away, they say, oh, we are interested to meet with you. Mm. And, was, and, and you guys met, so how'd that go? Um, yes, we met. It yeah. was a very good meeting. Did you bring him in quickly, or did you make him wait? No, no, we, <laughs> we met pretty quickly. And the, the Commissioner of Health was in attendance. And what was really fortunate is we had the opportunity to use some grant funds. And right. so we were able to 
um, partner with the imams as well as um, link them through our American Academy of Pediatrics right. to healthcare providers. And so the imam <coughs> and a healthcare provider then work together to provide information to the community. And um, if you know the time of year, this started in April and we were moving into um, Ramadan, which was starting in the beginning of June. June yep. And so they were able to use um, the many um, times for prayer during Ramadan as a chance to share information to the community about the importance of vaccination and public health. So can I ask you both for a minute, you know, thinking about both your dashboard and you saw this coming up and clearly you felt and saw this in your community and felt something had to be done. And, and part of the debate, just to, just to put it out there in the open, is that there are people out there funded, actively making films, uh, uh, pushing an agenda that vaccines are bad um, and destructive. And my understanding is that when this began popping, you also became a site for the anti-vaccinators to come in. So how did that work, where you both have measles breakout, but you also are contending with folks that are sending a different message? I mean, and, and did you look at, the, did you know that was going on? Oh yes, we were very. We were, but what's that like? Well, <laughs> um, it's definitely challenging. Um, we're very aware of the work of the anti-vaccine groups in our community, and they. I was surprised. I uh, naively had hoped that in the middle of a measles outbreak, that that would be pretty clear and strong evidence for the need for and value of vaccines. But they actually saw it as a as a reason to kind of step up their. Um, their in intervention, if you will, and so they were very involved. But what I thought was really um, wonderful was they had planned a, a meeting for the community, um, and it was to be held at Brian Coyle Center, which is sort of the heart of the community for the Somali community. It's kind of a place where they gather together. And um, the community really said no we, the community leadership said, no, we don't want you to be meeting in our center that represents our community. There was some acknowledgement mm. of the misinformation, and so they pulled the lease, and the, the group had to find another site. I don't know if you want to talk yeah, about yeah. that decision. And yes. Uh, also, I think, yes, we know that, and they did kind of also campaign anti-vaccination. But what we did was we put together the faith leaders who the community well respected, mm -hmm. and the health, uh, health uh, 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 professionals, and then we, are, we address the uh, community and talk to them and kind of use a, 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 a analogy is, for example, if you are sick and have a stomach issue, do you come to me as a faith leader or do you go to the doctor? The answer was, we go to the doctor. If that's the case, don't accept it. Uh, uh, the rumors. Don't accept the people who don't have any scientific uh, proof. Therefore, consult with the uh, doctors and nurses who know this uh, subject. And because of that, the community rejected and said, we don't need you guys here. Please go different, uh, different places. And I think mm. the message of working together with the faith leaders and also uh, doctors and nurses make a big uh, difference. You know, when I look at the scale of what you were dealing with, my, my notes here say that 8,000 people were exposed to measles, 500 were asked to stay home, 79 cases reported. So this is a huge deal in a community. Did, did, did this experience exacerbate racial and cultural tensions in Minnesota, or did it help heal and bring the communities together? Um, well, we were very... Uh, clear in our messaging from the Department of Health that this was not about um, any sort of race or ethnicity. This was about being unvaccinated. And so the emphasis was this is an issue of, of unvaccination. So yes, it was happening in the Somali community. Yes, there were challenges in how they um, were understanding vaccines and autism, but the bottom line is it had nothing to do with a person's race or ethnicity. It was all about choices about vaccination. And I think um, one thing that helped, if you will, was we did have additional cases. So the, the heart of the outbreak was in Minneapolis, and that's right. where our largest Somali population is. But we had additional cases in a couple of other places in greater Minnesota in non-Somali um, children who were unvaccinated. So it just reinforced that this was moving 
you know, in the unvaccinated community. To say that it improved race relations, that would maybe be a little, I mean, we were happy to have stopped the outbreak. Mm -hmm. I think if we wanted to, to take credit for improving race relations, that might be a yeah. little bit um, yeah. <laughs> much for the situation. Well, the fact that you work together so clearly, oh, so I yes. can imagine really interesting, positive, constructive stories about this. But Sharif, you know, I, I'm interested in what can be taken away from this experience and your understanding of which levers to push within your own community. I mean, you know, you're not you're not just a boss. You actually had to go and mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of bring people along in a certain way. What, what do you think, as you're talking to an audience of, of communities really across the country, and you're sitting here in Philadelphia, what are the lessons that, that you think are important to convey about that are translatable from the experience? So it's not just a unique moment, but a, but a teachable moment. I think, in number one, when, we, uh, when this kind of, this kind of uh, 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 crisis took place, I think, number one, what we need is come together and collaborate. That's number one. For example, what I did was, <coughs> Even when I tried to organize a seven different imams who took this uh, initiative with me, I called several of them, for example. Then they deny. They have uh, some kind of doubt and concern. Maybe vaccination and autism, some kind of connection. Therefore, I said, OK, I don't want to work with those ones who have some kind of doubt. Then I selectively use other seven uh, imams. And I talked to them one by one. Mm -hmm. And he said, you see, this is a crisis in our community and also in the state. Therefore, are you willing with me to work with me mm -hmm. this and talk to the uh, Department of Health and take this message to the community? And seven of them agree and say yes. Mm -hmm. And I think number one, uh, working together is number one. Number two, who, who representative to the community also number two? Because sometimes the reason I say that when some of, some of the imams have some doubt, if we do not get another influential imam who know the religion very well, and also who knows some kind of background a little bit for how health health system uh, works, maybe they win the battle. Therefore, we need to have another voice who intercounted that, who say that's not right, that's not true. Also, the second piece is that. I think the third piece is, I, I said earlier, we need to collaborate. We need the doctors, the nurse, and the imams. What, what worked for us that time was when seven imams took, took this message to their mosques and used the social media, maybe even Somali media, and talk to the community and encourage the community mm. to vaccinate your, your kids. And the well-being of your child and the well-being of the community, you are responsible of that. And also, every time we use that, some doctor may be with us, and also can scientifically, scientifically support our uh, message. I think when, that's a, a lesson we took from that uh, one, environment. One, one of the cool things someone told me about you was that you actually figured out a way to go talk to people and say, hey, Mohammed actually saw this coming. Mohammed actually has a response on, on <laughs> vaccines. So, so how did that work? Like One where minute. in the Quran does he talk about vaccine and the measles? Thank you so much. It's not <laughs> thank you. It's not exactly the word vaccination, but the tradition of Islam use a lot of uh, uh, intervention, mm. and we have what so called al wakayatu khairu min al ilaj, which means intervention better than cure. And I use that message a lot, and a lot, and a lot. One. Second one, Islam also have, has a verses in the Quran who says, if you do not know subject, ask the person or the people who know that subject. Mm. And I use that also over and over and over again. And my message was, please, don't ask the, the people who doesn't have any scientific knowledge. Ask the people who, who have that. The third piece was, I use also a little bit kind of a uh, back home uh, tragedy, which is how many children in Somalia, in East <coughs> Africa, who die at the age maybe of four or three or two because they don't have uh, vaccination, because they don't have the health care system we have uh, here. And it's good for us to use this and, and, and take care of our children, and also take care of the whole community. And I think that piece also was very, very uh, 
important and the people kind of listen to that when also a doctor supported that. So you can see why I feel very fortunate to have him on our team. I'd like to talk to him another hour and you know, figure out that, uh, more of this. But Kristen, let me ask you before we go to the audience um, with questions. I interviewed Vivek Murthy, the former Surgeon General, about this very same subject. And while interviewing him, Elmo popped out from Sesame Street. Uh, and, and it was around the notion of trying to find unique and different ways to sort of talk kids you know, and, then, and, and then have children develop some um, demand for this, some understanding, and help to reach parents. But not just in measles, but you cover so much of a wide terrain. Do you have any insights on how those of us, you know, that are looking at the science, looking at the infrastructure, can begin talking to people? What are the lessons that you've drawn out of the role that you have, whether it's on, on measles vaccination or, or just broadly infectious diseases, to get people to think about best practices in unique ways? Um, well, I have to say that um, currently we're in Minnesota, we're dealing with a multi-drug resistant uh, tuberculosis outbreak in mm. the Hmong community. And so yet again, another um, sort of cross-cultural, if you will, um, experience. And I think one of the things that we've learned from measles and um, from that situation is that um, while we may have expertise related to infectious disease, <coughs> we can't be successful unless we're partnering with the community and partnering with community leadership. And so we need to bring the community in very early because messages that may uh, be just fine to me as someone who's studied in this area and trained in this area um, don't resonate with a Hmong elder who you know, spent the first part of their life uh, in the jungles and is now, you know, in Minnesota when they're 80 years old. So we need to not only translate health messages, but we need to translate the culture. And I think um, in, in the case of measles with the Somali, we needed to have the faith leaders and we needed to have strong leadership to help us get our messages because we certainly have science that helps us, but to have someone like, um, Sharif who can say this is how what you're saying ties into our faith and ties into messages mm -hmm. from the Quran that is that is very powerful so I think that if we're going to be successful uh, no matter what it is if it's hand washing or getting vaccinated or other messages mm -hmm. about infectious disease if we're dealing with no matter what the culture is we need to be engaged with the, the community Did you find the Sharif in the Hmong community yet um, the Hmong community does have um, clan leadership. They have 18 clans and they meet together. And so we've reached out to the head of that group and he's, you know, he's been on the media and things. So yes, we, we have found those individuals in that community, but that's what it takes is to be engaged with the community. What a powerful story. Uh, let's go to the audience. Yes, hi, how are you? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jan Nissen from Merck. And the question is, thanks for sharing your story. Um, so when you look at, aside from the human cost, right, what were the indirect and direct costs medically to contain this? Wow. And then what did that do to the rest of the community in terms of things you couldn't fund at the community level? Sure, that's actually a great question. Um, and that's one of the messages that we certainly have taken away from this is not vaccinating <laughs> is not only costly in terms of the children who acquired measles, but it is just costly in dollars and cents. So the Department of Health spent close to $600,000 just in our response alone. Um, the Hennepin County um, Public Health Department, which is um, the county that has the city of Minneapolis in mm -hmm. it and where most of the cases were, they spent 400,000. So there's a million, million dollars, right there. Yeah. Um, and that does not include, you know, the cost for health care. So in other words, all of the health systems that were responding, the actual cost of hospitalizations for these kids. I mean, this was um, millions of dollars in terms of responding. So I think that is another um, good message mm -hmm. is just that um, not only are there costs to children who may, you know, um, have long-term effects from having had measles, but there are actual um, dollars and cents costs to the community. Great question. Yes, hi. Good, good morning, Ken Kelly, NIH. Um, fascinating story, and I applaud your efforts. Um, and I'm an optimist, but I have three tactical, practical, tough questions for mm. Kristen. First is, if there were so many um, cases of measles, and these anti-vaccination people came, 
did any of them contract measles? Mm. <laughs> Secondly, okay. if they're crossing a state line and inciting parents to not vaccinate children who could become ill, is there a potential crime involved? Mm. And thirdly, uh, there are certain faith-based communities that are not so pro-science. So what would you imagine happened if one of those communities was involved in anti-vaccination people showed up to promote and even worsen the case of a measles outbreak? Okay. Terrific questions. So first of all, um, the actual leadership, if you will, of the anti-vaccine group did not acquire measles. We did have a case, some of the cases that we had in non-Somalis, they were parents who were, what could be, you know, labeled, I suppose, anti-vaccine. And there was one young adult who, um, you know, clearly indicated when we were interviewing her that, yes, her, her mother was not mm -hmm. interested in, in vaccination. And in fact, that's why she hadn't been vaccinated. Right. But none of the, the visitors, so to speak, who were coming to talk about this um, acquired measles. Um, the one was, if you cross straight lines and you're oh, promoting people not to get vaccinated, is that a crime? You know, that is not something that we were focused on at the time. It's certainly something that might be worth having a conversation about, but we, we were so focused on responding to the outbreak that we were not um, thinking about those kinds right. of uh, issues, I and guess. And then finally, the, the good issue is, is that you've got some cultures and groups that are, that are, that are not friendly to science. Um, and that is just something that, that we have to, to deal with. And we, we wouldn't be able to find um, the leadership like we found with Sharif um, to help us out. That doesn't mean we don't get the message out, but it makes means just means that it's more challenging. Let me just ask you both what, one question as we finish and, and you respond. Um, the, the Jerry Brown in California, as I understand it, has actually uh, ended the faith-based exemption. So if you attend public schools, you must be vaccinated, and there are no exemptions that, that are now allowed under California law. So is that something you would consider in Minnesota? And, and so we'd love you to respond as well. Um, well, the, the decision making around um, vaccine exemptions is something that is done through our legislature. So the Department mm -hmm. of Health um, provides information and we can inform the decision. Right. We don't have ultimate control um, from a public health standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, my perspective is pretty <laughs> strong about the value of vaccination, but I, I just can't make those decisions. We have to work through our legislative process, but we certainly welcome the opportunity to have those discussions, particularly um, following this situation, this, you know, outbreak situation. Thank you. And I want to add a little bit of the question. Is that I think you, usually every community we get some people who are against of scientific but I think if we get, for example, the Somali community, the people who even against of the vaccination, they are not against of scientific in general. Mm. They have some doubt of vaccination, especially MMRI may be cause the autism. But even if we get that one, if we have part of the community, some people who know the culture, some people who know the religion, who also against of that, we usually we win the battle. But if we don't have Therefore, then they will say whatever they want to. That is, I think, uh, the problem. Yes, we have some, even imams, who have some doubt. But when we, when we organize seven imams in my side, also another seven or eight imams, 16 imams kind of work together and have campaigned for this, mm -hmm. they are not able to stand in front of us. Right. Therefore, we need, even if we get some culture, some people who say against of this, we need to have some people who have, who have a knowledge, but also understand how the scientific work is and how we can try to find a line between the scientific and faith. Kristen Erisman with the Minnesota Department of Health, Sharif Mohammed with the Islamic Civic Society of America, thank you so much for sharing this powerful story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, are vaccines a matter of personal choice or public health? Joining us for this conversation is State Senator Dalen Leach of the Pennsylvania Senate. Dr. Rachel Levine, Acting Secretary of Health and Physician General at the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Welcome back, The Atlantic's Olga Kazan. Okay. Um, 
So we are going to talk about an issue that um, I just learned backstage uh, generates the most hate mail of anything else that uh, we work on, <laughs> which is the, the anti-vaccine movement and uh, the importance of vaccines. Um, so so I'm, I'm here with, uh, with a state senator, uh, with, with uh, Dalen Leach, and with Dr. Rachel Levine. Um, and we're just going to talk about what the picture looks like in Pennsylvania. This anti-vax movement looks really different depending on where you go um, in different parts of the country. Um, so I kind of wanted to just dig into what it looks like here. So maybe you guys can both kind of first kick us off with uh, how did you kind of, what have you been seeing with vaccines personally in your history? Where did you, what's been your journey with vaccines, maybe both as a doctor and as a, as a legislator? So. Um, I'm a pediatrician yeah. and adolescent medicine specialist in terms of my initial training. Um, and I trained at Mount Sinai in New York City uh, in the 80s. And so actually I have seen children in my career that have had some of the diseases that we now protect those children from. And so one example would be HIV or Hib disease. Right. And that is a, a very serious bacteria uh, and bacterial infection that can cause conditions like meningitis, it can cause conditions such as sepsis and pneumonia. And I have treated those children in my career, uh, and they've ha I've had some children die of meningitis mm -hmm. from hip disease. Um, we now have a very safe and effective vaccine against that condition, which, which saves lives. And, and so I have seen that in my career. In addition, for instance, um, chickenpox, so varicella. Varicella, for most children, is, is a self-limited illness, but for children who have cancer or other compromised immune systems, it can be a serious life-threatening infection, uh, or for their parents who might have uh, those conditions. And I have seen children in my career in the 80s and 90s uh, that had um, immune suppression and had uh, varicella, had chickenpox, and had very, very serious life-threatening complications. So we have to remember the, the importance of these childhood vaccines that protect children from those life-threatening conditions. And now there is a vaccine for chickenpox. There is a vaccine yeah. for chickenpox. There's yeah. a vaccine for HIV. We have wow. a very safe vaccine against polio. Those are the conditions that we're protecting children against. Wow. Yeah, my journey with vaccines is sort of a circuitous one. I mean, I guess I started out as a child, you know, hating them <laughs> because they hurt. Um, and then I uh, lived a, a good bit of my life not thinking that much about them. Uh, then when I was uh, a lawyer, I, I actually went on my own after a couple of years. Um, and I was invited to join a consortium of lawyers who were co contemplating suing uh, f vaccines for a link to autism. Um, and I, you know, opportunistically, like when you're a young lawyer and you're, you're on your own, like you'll take, I mean, if someone comes in and they have a problem with battleship law, I'm an expert on battleship <laughs> law, right? Um, so I was like, yeah, man, excellent. So I got involved with this. Um, and then I started reading uh, all the studies, trying to get myself up to speed, and a couple big studies came out during this period. And I, I realized that there was just not the evidence there. And I think, you know, I did something uh, which, you know, I think we need to do more of, which is I changed my mind <laughs> uh, when confronted with facts. Um, and uh, I withdrew from the consortium. Uh, and then I actually handled some cases involving uh, the United States uh, uh, Court of Claims, which handles vaccine uh, related injuries, which exists for the exact opposite reason that uh, people who are against vaccines say it exists. It doesn't exist as a way to shield the pharmaceutical industry because, you know, we're all on the take or whatever. It's because vaccines are so important, we can't risk a company going out of business and not producing them anymore, so we have a separate situation to continue to allow them because every medication, aspirin, over-the-counter cough medicine, um, has an adverse reaction in some people, and that's true of vaccines. Uh, but, uh, you know, so I did some of that. Um, and then more recently, I was reading about all of the, uh, you know, the, in, the, the sort of reemergence of diseases like mumps and measles and other things because of a decrease in herd immunity and, and the lowering rates of vaccines. And I looked at our protocol in Pennsylvania, and we have some of the loosest laws in the country. I mean, we have a requirement, and uh, to the administration's credit, they've done a great job of strengthening that requirement. Um, but we have these exemptions. We have three exemptions. We have a medical, which is a legitimate exemption. There is the religious and the philosophical. And the philosophical to me is just like the I don't feel like it exemption. I mean, you don't have to explain your philosophy like, well, Heidegger said. You know, you don't have to do that. <laughs> you just have to say, I have a philosophy. I mean, and again, a lot of people who 
do that may not have a deep philosophy when you're, but anyway, they just don't want to do it. And having a rule that says, I don't want to do it, sort of eats the rule that says you have to do it. So I introduced uh, Senate Bill 217 to get rid of the philosophical exemption. People ask me, why not the religious exemption too? I'd like to get rid of that as well. Um, I just wanted to do things in sort of manageable bites. In politics, you learn that's the way to get things done. But uh, you know, we're, we're pushing that, and I think the evidence is compelling that we need to tighten up the laws to ensure that we have a, the right number of children being vaccinated. And so talk about kind of the evolution of this movement in Pennsylvania. How, kind of when did this all start and kind of who are the people who are asking for these exemptions and uh, what is the, the overall, I guess, exemption rate or, or not vaccinated rate now? So uh, when we started in the administration in 2015, uh, that was in January, that was exactly when there was the measles outbreak uh, in California. Uh, and we did have one case of measles in Pennsylvania that year um, uh, in January, which was unassociated with the California outbreak, but it um, uh, allowed us to take a look at our immunization rates. And what we found is for, for measles that uh, we had about an 85 to 86 percent immunization rate, which is getting close to, you know, it's really low, below the herd immunity uh, uh, place that we want, which would be 95 percent oh, okay. um, for, for measles. And so we took a look at what would be the most significant change that we could make through regulation change in Pennsylvania. And that was to change the, the, um, the period of time um, from which children enter school to the times that the children have to be have to have their immunizations up to date and there was an extended eight month period of time mm -hmm. uh, regulations from the 70s that uh, that allow children to not have their immunizations up to date for eight months uh, during the school year which wow. meant from almost most of the school year many children did not have their immunizations up to date and so what we did with regulation change, um, which took time, is we worked very closely with the Department of Education to change that regulation so that it's now five days. Okay. And so children in the, within the first week of school have to have their immunizations up to date or to have a plan to do so with their pediatrician or their family physician. Now, to accompany that, we had a very robust communication strategy um, with the Department of Education, with the school nurses, with uh, pediatricians and family physicians, et cetera, um, so that uh, parents and families uh, would get their checkups and their immunizations in the spring uh, and in the summer. I mean, we, we actually talked about it when kids register for, uh, for kindergarten um, uh, in, in, the late, in the late spring. Uh -huh. And so this year was the first year that that regulation was in place. Um, and uh, I think that, that uh, uh, the families can be reassured that uh, kids in school right now have their immunizations up to date. We will be collecting all of that data in December, and so we'll be verifying that in the new year and analyzing any, any difficulties. But we feel very, uh, very good about that, that, um, that change, that without um, adversely affecting anybody, we were able to improve immunization rates for children in Pennsylvania. Wow. And can you give us a sense, I mean, for people who don't, and I know that some of this might be anecdotal and you don't want to paint any community with a broad brush. So of course, these we're talking about a fringe minority. But are, are the people, I mean, you mentioned they're not necessarily Heidegger fans, but the, the, the folks who are asking for these exemptions, I know in, in California, a lot of times it's actually like wealthier parents. In, in Pennsylvania, who are the folks who are asking for these? Um, so as the senator pointed out, there are three exemptions. So yeah. one is a medical exemption. Mm -hmm. And so that would be a child who might have an immune deficiency, who might have cancer, that cannot receive the vaccination. But that one's legitimate, right? That's... Uh, well, uh, um, th that is a medical exemption. Right. Um, and so that's actually why we want all the other children to have their immunizations, to have what the senator referred to as herd immunity, is that we want, if, if enough children are vaccinated, then they were extremely unlikely to have an outbreak like they saw in California. And then as the senator was mentioned, you can have a philosophical exemption and religious exemption. And so there are a number of different groups in, in, in Pennsylvania that, that, have, um, that have used th those exemptions. Um, one example I think that we were talking earlier uh, would be the Amish, Amish and Mennonite community in Lancaster and elsewhere. Uh, we actually do have efforts um, uh, in the Department of Health to have our, our public health nurses mm -hmm. uh, go out to the Amish and Mennonite community to speak with the elders um, about the importance and the safety of vaccines. And, and under certain circumstances, for instance, if there's danger of an outbreak, uh, we sometimes are successful in having the, the, the children immunized. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, 
the, uh, we started looking at what other states were doing. And you know, like one of the states with the tightest laws, oddly enough, is Mississippi. <laughs> um, and um, you know, in Mississippi, they have much higher vaccination rates. And like, you know, we're behind Mississippi, on, well, on most things actually. But um, the, 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 and, and as, as, as Olga alluded to, you know, I'm, in, I'm involved in a lot of controversial issues because that's what I think the fun of the job is. So whether it's, uh, you know, abortion or gay marriage or marijuana or taxes or guns, like I'm, I like to be in the thick of those things. So I get a lot of hate mail, you know? Um, and uh, plus, with my personality, that sort of magnifies. But anyway, the, uh, the most vociferous and, and extreme mail I've ever gotten on any issue is vaccines. And, and so, on my vaccine bill. And so I was like, I tried to like think through why that is. And, and, and it makes sense in a way in, because you're, you're dealing with people's children and there's nothing they feel sort of more, um, you know, uh, strongly about. And I understand the idea that people, you know, people, a kid gets autism or whatever, and, they're, and, and you know, it's, it's terrible, and they, they, they want an answer, and they want to know why, and they cling on to, to something that they see as an explanation, because without an explanation, it's very difficult to process. Um, and we live in a time, I think, where, uh, you know, conspiracy theories are now more sort of mainstream, uh, and that objective facts are less, um, you know, uh, considered true, and that there's sort of a, you know, if you like this set of facts, then that's true. If you like this set of facts, then that's true. Um, and that means that people easily sort of, I think, fall prey to people who say, oh, I can answer whatever, you know, you have a problem, you have an issue that you, you're upset about, I can give you a theory that explains it and put, you know, puts the blame on something that you can, and I, I understand the psychology behind that which is why I think that programs like this are so important because we have to educate people about the truth of this because there are lives at stake as the doctor uh, indicated. I mean, children are dying from preventable diseases because of you know, false information. And you know, I, I say to friends, like I'm, I'm, I'm a fairly progressive guy, uh, and I say to, you know, because this spans the ideological spectrum, the, the, the anti-vaccine situation, and I'm like, you know, I get emails from people who are very upset, and I say, you, you're, you just sent me an email about how we have to do something about climate change, because that's what the scientific consensus is. Well, if science is real, it's got to be real across the board. Like, we've got, you know, the scientific consensus can't be true on climate change, but complete hooey on vaccines. So if we're going to, you know, if we're going to govern ourselves by what science says, we have to, I think, do that across the board to be consistent. Yeah, and I think there's a reluctance also to, to change your mind, like, like you did yeah. earlier in your career. So, And have you guys found any messaging or education efforts that, that do work? I mean, I know it's so, like, there have been all these studies that actually, you know, telling someone that the facts are actually the opposite of what they think can actually lead to this backlash. What have you guys found? Well, so with the Department of Health, we, we've had um, a number of communication initiatives, both about about the safety and, and efficacy of vaccines, uh, mm -hmm. about our program to have kids immunized um, and have their checkups before they start school. We also have had a lot of contact um, with uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the family physicians as well. And I think that one of the best relationships and the best way that families can understand the, the safety, necessity, and how effective vaccines are is by talking with their doctor. Yeah. And so we have great pediatricians in our state. We have fantastic children's hospitals with other health systems and, and other great pediatricians in practice uh, and family physicians as well. And I think that that relationship can, can really um, can really highlight it. Now, one of the important aspects is even how doctors talk to their patients about things. Huh. And an example would be a vaccine called HPV, huh. the human papillomavirus vaccine, which protects against cervical cancer. It protects against other types of oral cancer, penile cancer, anal cancer. And so uh, that vaccine is supposed to be started, that's scheduled at 11 to 12 years of age. If a pediatrician talks to their family and say, okay, we're going to get the vaccines, you're going to get a, a, a booster for your diphtheria, whooping cough, and tetanus, you're going to get a vaccine against meningitis, okay. 
Now, they pause. Now, let's talk about the HPV vaccine. That is sending, actually, an unintended message right. to parents that somehow this vaccine is different. This vaccine is not different. It is a very safe, a very effective vaccine that protects against cancer. Mm -hmm. And so we work with our health, with the healthcare professionals in the state in order to craft that message that this is another very important, safe, effective vaccine that protects against serious illness and that we can prevent. That's a really good point. Is it just sort of added to the list as though it's, it's just another one of it's these? It's just yeah. another vaccine. We're going yeah. to give one, two, and three, in the, and, and, and it's just part of the, of, the, of the conversation as opposed to pausing, waiting five seconds, and saying, now let's talk about this controversial vaccine. It right. actually should not be a controversial yeah. vaccine, and, and it's very important to increase uh, the rates of immunizations of our, of our young people um, uh, against this preventable cancer. Right. Well, I'm going to take audience questions in a minute, but first I, I wanted to talk about this new kind of trend that I'm seeing among some parents who believe that there's actually, um, it, the problem is not vaccines in general, but like getting too many vaccines at one point in, I guess, when you're too young. I don't know what the exact objection mm -hmm. is, but it's almost like, oh, they're overloading their immune systems, they're not ready. How do you guys, uh, first of all, what's the kind of science behind that? And also, how do you counteract that? So the science is that that's not true, is that we're not overloading children's <laughs> immune systems. Um, uh, and uh, we do have, uh, thankfully, a lot of illnesses that we can give vaccines and prevent. Um, and so uh, the pediatricians and physicians um, at the American Academy of Pediatrics at the CDC have worked it out very carefully a very precise schedule for pediatricians and family physicians to give vaccines to children. It is extremely safe. We're not overloading their immune system. We're not making them ill. Um, there sometimes can be a little soreness at the site of a mm -hmm. shot, as there always can be. Sometimes there's some fever um, afterwards, but it's a very safe schedule, and they're really at exactly the right time to protect children against these extremely serious mm -hmm. illnesses um, at the time that they should be given. For instance, we immunize against polio, you know, starting at two months. We immunize against whooping cough, pertussis, because whooping cough in young children is extremely serious illness. We start the hepatitis B vaccine at birth, and there are reasons for that to protect um, children right, right from the fact that they were born. So it's been actually very carefully and very scientifically thought out. Right. And this is exactly what we, we need. We need sort of calm... Uh, and also, there, by the way, there's a, an issue that we get a lot about thimerosal and preservatives, and the science also is very clear on that as well. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, we need sort of calm, rational discussion. And I know my sort of communication style has evolved over time, because at the beginning I, was, I found the whole, you know, not <coughs> Im immunizing kids against preventable diseases so irrational, I would sort of, you know, push back a lot more and I, you know, I'd be like, you know, screw me, well, screw you. And it was, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that was as effective as it could be. So uh, uh, now I'm trying to uh, adopt more of a, a Dr. Levine-like approach. Uh, <coughs> uh, and and I, so we've tried to, uh, from the political side, I've, I've had a couple of town halls <coughs> where we've invited Sorry, physicians, do you need a vaccination now or are you okay? Yeah, no. I'm, um, I'm a doctor. You know, I know. You know. <laughs> I know CPR, that's it. Um, but anyway, the, uh, you know, we've had town halls, we've invited physicians, and we take questions and we try, as, as we've seen, to calmly answer with the science. I mean, I think you, know, you won't break through to everybody, um, but hopefully you'll break through to some. And again, that's why we have a mandate. We have an obligation to, prevent, to protect public health. One of the biggest pushbacks I get as an argument is, well, it's my child, I should be able to do whatever I want. And that's not true. I mean, if you are, you know, I have children. Uh, if I was denying, you know, if my child had diabetes and I was not, I was refusing to give insulin, the, you know, children in the services would come and take that child away from me. Um, and, and uh, you know, uh, this is the, uh, in the same vein. This is, uh, you know, life-saving, important medication. And not only, unlike diabetes, unlike uh, that, you know, it doesn't just protect your child. It protects other people's children. You don't have a right to make a decision which puts not only your child, but other people's children at risk for preventable diseases. That seems like such a, an obvious thing. But we have to, you know, it's, education is a process, and we have to go through that process. Okay, do we have questions? <coughs> Hi, I'm Wendy Bailey from Merck. And as a scientist, um, 
I'm getting increasingly alarmed about the tenor of the scientific discussion in our country when um, our legislators are actually proposing health care bills that don't think pregnancy should be covered. I mean, it seems rather outrageous. So when you're, we're up against those kinds of discussions, you know, where does a vaccine dialogue fall in that? And um, I, like Olga's question, how can we begin to move that needle on that dialogue and not continually be butting heads because it's ineffective? And, we, and, and I feel like we're at a crisis point that we need to move that needle and because it, it, it's so outrageous that the, I, I'm, I can't believe the discussions we're having, the debates we're having about health care right now and yeah. what's acceptable is, is crazy. So Yeah, no, well, I, I would say, I mean, that's, it's, it is a uh, troubling issue. I mean, um, uh, in, in some of the proposals to change the health care law nationally, there, there was the uh, getting rid of the mandatory coverage of, of certain things. Among the things in some of the bills that would no longer be covered, for example, were hospital stays. Which is like, yeah, uh, I, you know, um, and, and so it, it is. I, I think that we have to. I'd love to remove the discussion of healthcare uh, as a political um, sort of jousting point. Uh, I think that we have plenty of other things to fight about. I really would love to see a consensus on just getting people whatever healthcare is appropriate, as decided by trained physicians, and making sure that happens. That seems like it should be. The rest of the world has figured this out. Um, we are still fighting over that. Uh, just parenthetically, one more thing. I, from Merck, I frequently get emails that I'm on the take uh, from Merck and the rest of the pharmaceutical industry, and I try to explain that to be on the take, someone has to be on the give. Um, <laughs> and, and Merck has been horribly negligent in offering me huge chunks of money uh, to, you know, so if you can talk to your folks and see if we can... So I'd like to answer that as well. Not that part, but I'll, I'll, I won't touch that. Um, but in terms of, of um, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, I mean, it, it, Governor Wolf is a very strong supporter of the Affordable Care Act. It's absolutely essential in terms of health care coverage in our country. Uh, it certainly needs to be improved, but it has improved um, health care accessibility and affordability. One example would be Medicaid, of course. And one of the first things that Governor Wolf did in the administration was to expand Medicaid to 720,000 people in Pennsylvania who now have quality and uh, uh, health insurance, and that includes children. So in terms of affordability and accessibility of vaccines, the focus of today's talk, there is no reason why any child should not have access to vaccines. Medicaid in Pennsylvania covers all of the vaccines. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. CHIP, Children's Health Insurance Program, covers all of the vaccines. Commercial insurance companies in Pennsylvania cover all of the vaccines. And for any child that is underinsured or uninsured, they, we have the Vaccine for Children's program, and they can get immunizations at our, um, at our state health centers. Right. So there is no financial reason in any way why a child in Pennsylvania should not get their vaccines. Right. So people, get your vaccines, and we can go read our hate mail. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all so much again, and thank you so much, Senator and Dr. Levine. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate that. Yeah. For a conversation on understanding the science behind vaccines, please welcome Dr. Paul Offit, the Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases and Director of the Vaccine Education Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And here to lead the conversation is the Atlantic Steve Clemens. <laughs> but that was good, I thought. Yeah. Paul, I feel, as I said, we're at your party here, and so uh, we're going to entertain your guests. Um, we were just having a fascinating conversation that has completely changed the, the way I was going to open this. Um, and we were talking about communicating science and, and, and good science and bad science. And this gentleman this morning uh, asked a question essentially about bad science being published in journals. I want to thank you for that interesting question. And it occurred to me as, a, as an MSNBC contributor, is there sort of an MSNBC and a Fox and an NPR and a CNN of the scientific journal community that, that essentially what's happened is you know, I, I look at Margaret Lowe, who used to be head of NPR at, at, at the, uh, uh, the news division there, and so, you, you know, for many people, NPR is, is the thing that gives it straight and without bias, et cetera. Maybe some people would disagree with that, but I think part of the interesting question is, has science become uh, uh, channeled, if you will, into not what leads us into rational understanding of what needs to happen, but rather politics is becoming part of the equation? Well, I mean, there are 
scientific journals that are considered to be excellent scientific journals. You know, New England Journal of Medicine, Nature, Science, Cell. So that's NPR. The ones. That's like, but, but you know, yeah. it's an imperfect system. I mean, the, the, you, you know, there was an article published in the early 1980s in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine by a Harvard epidemiologist claiming that excess coffee drinking caused uh, pancreatic cancer. That was wrong. And study after study showed that that was wrong. And, and that's the strength of science. I mean, it's, it's, I think one should be skeptical of scientists. I think one should be skeptical of any paper that's published independent of where it's published. Right. But, but the strength of science is its reproducibility. Mm -hmm. if, that sta if, if that contention was correct, then study, other studies done by other investigators using other populations will show that it's correct. I think science stands on two pillars that sort of gets to this man's question mm -hmm. earlier, one of which is much weaker than the other. The first pillar, which is the weaker pillar, is peer review. Right. I think it's a flawed system. I mean, it's a human endeavor, and humans right. are flawed. I think re reproducibility is the great case. Catchment, though. If you're, mm. if you're wrong, there's no hiding. I mean, Andrew Wakefield published his paper claiming that MMR caused autism in the, in the Lancet. That's an excellent general medical journal, one of the oldest general medical journals. That was wrong, and it was shown to be wrong. How did the modern anti-vaccination movement begin? I think it began on April 19, 1982. That was with the, when Lee Thompson, who was a veteran executive producer at, um, at NBC, uh, put out a one-hour documentary called DPT Vaccine Roulette. Mm -hmm. And that was a dramatic show. It, it was, showed a series of children who, whose parents all told the same story. My child was fine, then they got this whooping cough for pertussis vaccine, and look what happened. And you saw these children who had bicycle helmets that were seizing, that had withered arms and legs, drooling, staring up vacant in the sky, and these parents told these dramatic, heartfelt stories that the, the pertussis vaccine had caused permanent brain damage. Now, that wasn't true. Epidemiological study after epidemiological study showed that that wasn't true. Eventually, it, although it took 25 years, we had the genetic tools in hand to enable us to go back and look at these children to find out that they really had something called a sodium channel transport defect, or VET syndrome, but it, which obviously wasn't caused by vaccines. Has NBC done an equally powerful review of that, of that yeah, uh, no. genetic basis? No, maybe MSNBC can do it. Yeah. But, I'll, 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 I'll transmit the message. So, so I think that yeah. crossed the line. I think now suddenly people had the notion that vaccines weren't the lifesaver they were claiming to be. Maybe they were doing more harm than good. And, and, I, and there were congressional hearings. Ultimately, there was a group formed called Dissatisfied Parents Together, get it, DPT, which became the National Vaccine Information Center, which is Barbara Lloyd Fisher's group. That's the premier anti-vaccine group. So what would you do, given this terrain? Because I've noticed in the Daily Beast articles you write, I recommend them. Uh, 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 Paul is a regular contributor, I guess, to Daily Beast on all these issues. You become rather strident and, and, uh, to, in, in terms of encouraging folks to take on this community and, and not get deluded by the fact that there's some sort of rights-based rejection of science. I think I've always been strident, but, but thank yeah. you. Um, I, I, I think, sure, it's, it's just, um, you know, we, we especially our, our medical students, our right. young medical students today are trained to be open, differently than I'm trained, in many ways better, right. the, to be open to sort of all kinds of attitudes and beliefs, especially cultural differences. And I think that's good. But on the other hand, when a parent chooses not to vaccinate their child, when they choose to send them out into a world that is becoming progressively more dangerous, right. more measles, more whooping cough, more mumps. Um, it's a bad choice based on bad information. And I think it's OK to step in there and to be prescriptive, to be tough, to say, let me love your child. Don't put me in a position as a physician to send them out into a world that's progressively more dangerous. You know, don't ask me to practice substandard care. Please don't put me in that position. And it's hard for us to do that. I, I think we like but to But you've gone that. further, as I understand. You've said anti-vaxxers are screaming fire in a, in a theater. Yeah, I think I think actually the the group that was here before with Chris Ayersman and the Imam that uh, that when there was an outbreak of measles in in Minneapolis or in Hennepin County, Minnesota, um, you know that, that ultimately involved seventy nine children having to suffer needlessly. Um, there was a, an anti vaccine person, Mark Blaxel, who came into that community and said, "Don't listen to the public health people. Don't get your vaccine." Uh, this was during an outbreak. Uh, there was a clear and present danger. I'm sorry, that violates your First Amendment right. rights. And, and you're right. That's what I wrote in that piece. You were telling me that the, you know, in, in inventing the uh, uh, rotavirus uh, vaccine, that that was a 26 year effort and that, that you know, that's there and you're, you're in touch with everybody kind of in the vaccine community. I'm just sort of interested in the question we started out this morning and kind of connecting some of the dots today. As you look at 
your 26 years of research to get to that point. What do you think the big game changers are in science that, that, that may bring down that length of time, that give us new opportunities? I mean, given the, the, the fact that you, you achieved something before technology was where it is today, what excites you and what disturbs you? Well, remember, it's when you were trying to make vaccines, say, in the 1960s, the right. measles vaccine, the mumps vaccine, the German measles vaccine, then you would do uh, trials that would involve 3,000 children, 5,000 children. Um, and you could, Maurice Hilleman, who was mentioned right. earlier, you know, he isolated the mumps va virus from his daughter that became that vaccine in 1963. Hmm. That was a, a commercial vaccine in 1967. That could never happen today. Um, you know, the, the bar that, that one has to meet is, is, is not to just prove or disprove uh, uncommon side effects pre-licensure, but to disprove, frankly, rare side effects pre-licensure. -pre so therefore, the number of children that are tested, the phase one, phase two, phase three trials, mm -hmm. are much bigger and more expensive. And so the efforts don't become four-year or five-year efforts. They become 20 or 25-year efforts, and they become billion-dollar efforts. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's fine, because I think you know, we're giving vaccines are a product that are given to healthy children. So they should be held to a very high standard of safety, and they are. And do you think that's happening uh, consistently here around the world? What is, your, what is your sense of the health of that ecosystem for research? In? Yeah, I think, I think the research ecosystem is, is excellent. Um, I think science that's done in this country as well as other countries is excellent. I, I, I worry that, as David Weiner alluded to earlier, that, that there is a fraying of the, the vaccine infrastructure. I mean, mm. we had 27 companies that made vaccines for America's children. In, in 1955, by mm. 1980, that was 18 companies. Today, there's really four or five companies. And that's true also in the world. Uh, that there seems to be some fraying of the infrastructure because the fact of the matter is vaccines are something you give once or a few times in your lifetime. They're never going to be big money makers. They're never going to be blockbusters. Um, they're not going to be like lipid lowering agents or psychiatric drugs or neurological drugs. They're never going to be blockbusters. And I think when they're made just by big companies, which is true now, I mean, mm. being one example, they tend to be the weaker sister within the, the, the bigger pharmaceutical uh, product. You know, one of the other things you and I um, were chatting about were just the times we're in, they feel more fragile. Uh, science seems to be in a more desperate situation in a, in a sense of having to defend itself uh, from communities more. And I'm interested in your insights into that, whether because you've been through, and it's not like Andrew Wakefield just happened. This is, there's, been a, there's been a community that has long questioned science, long questioned vaccine, you know, vaccines and the, and the profession and science in general. But, but what do you think is going on in the country where, where what, at least to me, seem to be fringe views have become more mainstream views? It's certainly not new. I mean, certainly evolution denialism is not new. Um, you know, fears, unfounded fears about fluoridation is not new. I mean, if you want to sort of a, a wonderland of, of uh, false beliefs about science, just go to the Whole Foods store at 10th Street, and, and you can see the, you know, you can buy your GMO-free foods and your BPA-free free foods. I mean, this is not uh, right. good science. But, so I don't think that's new. Um, I, climate change denialism is new. What's new, I think, is that you have an administration that sort of embraces that. I mean, you, you know, the head of the EPA, the head of the Energy Department are climate change denialists. Our president is a climate change denialist. Um, you know, you have the, a vice president and, a, and a, a head of the secretary, a secretary of the Department of Education who are evolution denialists. I mean, that's frightening, actually, that we're willing to not deny science at that level. So what is science's response? You know, one of the questions, and I'm you know, looking at, at, at some of the material, I'm talking to many of you that are engaged not only in science, but communications. You work with communities in states. You deal with a lot of children. What is the, do you, do you just sit back and take it, or what are the marketing communication methodologies that you think need to be brought to bear? I think people need to understand what science is and what it isn't. Um, what it isn't is it isn't scientists, it isn't scientific textbooks, it isn't even accumulated knowledge, frankly. I mean, as you learn more as you go, you're willing to sort of throw that over your shoulder without a backward glance. Science is a process whereby that's, that's mutable, that's changeable. We're constantly learning, and I think that's uncomfortable for people. I think one of the reasons that Andrew Wakefield has the sort of limited following he has is that he is immutable. I mean, he sees a certain truth and, and, and he sees the light and although no one else seems to, in the science world seems to believe him, he knows that it's true. And for some parents that's really attractive. Mehmet Oz, Deepak Chopra, this kind of guru phenomenon I think is very attractive. I, I mean, I think if you ask people in this audience whether or not 
we will know more 100 years from now about, about diseases of people, I think everyone would say yes. But yet, if they have a disease, a specific disease, they would like to believe we know everything we need to know about that disease right now, even though that may not be true. I and mean, we take our best guess based on the information that we have. And I think that's disconcerting for some. And also, again, Scientists get it wrong all the time. That's okay. I mean, Brian McMahon got the coffee causes pancreatic cancer you know, story wrong, which caused people to hesitate about whether they drink coffee, not stop drinking coffee. They're willing to stop getting vaccines, but not stop drinking coffee. And, and see, people will say, see, see, that's why you can't trust science. But that's why you can trust science, because it is, it is self-correcting. There is no hiding if you have a bad, bad uh, hypothesis. And I think people need to understand that, um, that I mean, there's Nobel Prizes that were awarded. There was, there was a Nobel Prize awarded in 1935 to Igaz Moniz for the mm. development of psychosurgery that essentially lobotomies could cure schizophrenia, could score, cure manic depressive illnesses. That was wrong, um, and time showed that it was wrong, but we performed lobotomies in this country up until the 1970s. That's fascinating. You know, one of the things that's been interesting to me is to hear the name Maurice Hilleman about 20 times at this conference, and I've never heard of him uh, before, and that's my own ignorance. But I knew Andrew Wakefield way before. And you know, one of the things I, I you know, and you're the Maurice Hilleman endowed professor, I guess, at the University of Pennsylvania. And I think everyone here knows who, who he is and the contributions that he made. Um, Andrew Wakefield has been popularized in movies. In fact, you appear in the movie, as I understand, uh, the, 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 the pathological optimist or something like that. Not this. willingly, yeah, but yeah. yeah. Just a yeah. And, and, and so I am shot. interested in the notion of celebrities in science, since you've mentioned Nobels. And, you know, why someone who's made such profound contributions in, in the area of vaccine is, is not well known out, out there popularly, but someone like Andrew Wakefield, who has uh, been, you know, was credited with sort of leading with a lot of the non-vaccination movement, um, is so better known. So I, I think, well, here's what I would say. I think Jonas Salk is well known. Yeah, I, I mean, right. so, so, so there's And a Louis Pasteur is well known. And Louis Pasteur is well known. But it took hundreds of years. Albert Sabin, yeah. maybe to some extent, yeah. is well known. It would be interesting to ask people less than 30 years old whether right. they, they know Salk and Sabin. But, but, you know, and the reason is, is that the March of Dimes um, was a, you know, private philanthropic organization that held him up as their poster boy in many right. ways. He, he here's what we can do. Here's the science that Dr. Salk is doing. He was on TV. He was on the radio. He was a celebrity scientist right, at that right. time in the 1950s and 60s. And um, to some extent, so was Albert Sabin. So I think, I think there's that. Hilleman worked for a company. And I think, um, one, we don't like our heroes to come from industry. We mm -hmm. like them to come from academia. I think, you know, with all due respect to Merck, I do think they didn't do a lot to publicize him then. Mm -hmm. Although, interestingly, Maurice Hillman was on um, a CBS uh, uh, Evening News <laughs> once mm -hmm. with, with uh, Charles Coll Collingsworth, I think. Oh. Coll Collingswood, Collingsworth. But in any case, the, he was on that. So, so I'm, but you're right, he, he, that, that he was never the celebrity. So I think Andrew Wakefield is popular because he has a um, solution to a problem that medicine doesn't have a solution for. He knows what causes autism, even though he's wrong. Mm. Plus, he's, he's well-spoken, he's attractive, and he has a British accent. This is it. We're, I, just, we're, I think that's part of it. We're willing to turn ourselves back to the queen, I think, now. Given the no, but it, 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 I mean, I, th I think it's interesting because, you know, in, in terms of thinking about our discussions today on global public health, domestic public health, so much of it, even with Kristen, uh, with what was going on in, in the state of Minnesota, so much of it comes out to reaching community leaders, communicating, figuring new ways, uh, Vivek Murthy and Elmo. And, and I'm just, you know, it's just leading me to this question because you are actually a good communicator and you're thoughtful both about how to reach kids and children and sort of change the vector where recalcitrant parents may not be uh, in the game. That's a different question than science, right? That's a function of marketing and communications and other kinds of networks and whether or not we need to have greater investment in that kind of thing, whether that might move it forward. And then I'm going to go to um, all of you for questions on this. But, but you, know, you, you are a communicator and you are in these networks and you do play a leading role. What would you feel would be great uh, 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 help in that that you don't have today to actually take back some of the territory in the vaccination? arena. Right. So, so I, think, I think scientists need to get in the game. I think no one can explain what they do better than them because they're right. doing it. So I do, but I do think they need to understand what it means to communicate science. But first of all, it's harder because, you know, I think only one of every 300 minutes on television, for example, is devoted to science. I think most people in the general public, when they hear the word science, it's their eyes glaze over because mm. now they're about to be bored by something. So I think you have to make what you do dramatic and exciting and entertaining because the fact that, I mean, I was funded by the mm. National Institutes of Health for 
through, through the R1 mechanism for 25 right. years. I mean, who paid my salary? It was the public that paid my salary. Right. It was the taxpayer that paid my salary. And the taxpayer can just as quickly decide not to pay that, that salary. Mm. So they need to understand what they're getting for this money and why it's so important. But I think scientists need to do it. And that's hard because I, I think that um, the scientific the scientist's personality tends to be somewhat introverted, right? That's the old joke. What's the difference between an introverted scientist and an extroverted scientist? You know, an introverted scientist, when they talk to you, will look down at their shoes, but an extroverted scientist will look down at your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's true. So I think, I think and the training also for science is to be very careful about what you say, never to yeah. go beyond your data. Technically, you can't say MMR doesn't cause autism. You can't. You can never prove never. You can only say that all the evidence you have doesn't support that hypothesis, which sounds like a door is being left open. So the language has to be uh, altered a little bit. And I, so Alan Alda, for example, has a, 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 a program at uh, Sunny, uh, uh, Stony Brook where mm. he's trying to, to teach scientists how to communicate science to the public. But I think that's a good start. Wow, that's fascinating. Well, let me open up the questions, comments. Yes, right back here in the back, We're, the gentleman we started with this morning. No, we're gonna, she's going to bring a microphone to you. We have millions and millions and millions of people watching online. <laughs> but, want to hear. Yes. Uh, um, I'm Rui Chow at the uh, Philadelphia College of Pharmacy in the University right. of Sciences. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, the Atlantic for bringing this very important question. And secondly, I'd, I'd like to um, uh, congratulate Dr. Uh, Offner, um, is it Otter, is that right? Uh, Otter. Uh, Otter. Um, I think I met you once before, but anyway, um, this question that you raised is very important, that scientists, so there may be a forum for the Atlantic to discuss what is good science, what is bad science. Unfortunately, Scientists don't really know. The reason is that we have been fooled our, ourselves mm. in, to a great extent. And there are a number of publications which really are addressing this. Um, in particular, the reproducibility of science. The science is not really that reproducible, unfortunately. Um, there are several papers that really uh, show this, uh, right. uh, this aspect. One of the major points is that scientists don't quite really understand the basis of analysis using statistics. Mm -hmm. And we, gen we generally say the, the significance of 0.05 already lends, lends the credence to our hypothesis. But in fact, that is wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is really what I think education of scientists by scientists, by statisticians, will be a very important aspect. Thank you very much. Quick yeah, thought, I, I push back a little bit. I mean, I think, I think that, that sometimes there are studies that are done that are not reproduced, which makes you wonder whether or not the study was correct. I mean, mm. the, the question, for example, whether MMR caused autism, I think that you have reproducibly seen now 17 studies done in seven countries on three continents involving hundreds of thousands of children that showed that that was wrong. So that's, that's reproducible. Therefore, to me, that is now a fact. So climate change is a fact. Evolution is a fact. I mean, so, so there are But facts. I think to go back to my first question in our conversation, one of the things that interests me is that if you're in the Lancet or if you're in very legitimate publications, you can see a debate, you can see people take on and test your views. You also said, though, that there is a, a trend where anyone with money can go out and find some vanity publication and put something out there that has some digest. And to some degree, that's part of what we're talking about today. And that's when I ask about the Fox, the MSNBC, the Breitbart of news production, whether or not that becomes a problem because you have, you're competing not really over science, but about something that's not subjected to that same rigorous you're standard. Right. The so-called predatory journals, where you, know, you can get anything published. Um, anybody can get anything published as long as they're willing to pay the publication fee. It's sad, but it's, it's a reality. It's a sad reality. Let's, let's take one quick one here, one quick one there. Yes. Hi, Ken Kelly, NIH. So skip science, skip the news. What about fiction? What about Hollywood? Great. Harvard School of Public Health did a big campaign in Massachusetts that was anti-smoking, tobacco control. And I, I, I apologize, I don't remember the name of the professor's group, but they went to Hollywood and tried to get anti-smoking in movies and TV shows as a way to promote, to play on emotion, if you will. Uh, and it had a much better audience. So why not that approach? Yeah, why, why not there? And, no, and, I think that, yeah. I agree. I think that's a great idea. I think Mad Men probably set that whole notion back about 10 years, but you're right. I mean, I think that's, that's a good point. Uh, great, and this gentleman right here. Big round of applause for Emily, who's running like crazy. Uh, Craig Steiner, a physician. So I want to just change this slightly. Uh, it's just focusing on the physicians providing and, and the nurses are providing the vaccine. So if the standard of care is to give a vaccine from a pediatrician, and the physician is told not to give 
the vaccine by the patient's mother, right. parent, is he, per, is he actually now practicing mal, as a malpractice? I mean, because he's not meeting the standard of care Great for the question. community. Uh, it's, it's an interesting question. So, 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 for example, Steve Black, when he was head of Northern California Kaiser Permanente, tells the following story. There was a woman who came to, this is before the American Academy of Pediatrics declination form, but the, a woman who, who brought her child in to see the doctor, and she refused vaccines, including the Haemophilus influenza B or Hib vaccine, two, four, six months of age. What he did, what the doctor did, was he actually had the, the patient say, I've just been told vaccines are good, vaccine preventable diseases are bad, and I'm choosing not to get a vaccine. Signed it, two, four, six months of age. At 11 months of age, the child got Hib meningitis and was permanently damaged by that infection. She then turned around and sued the doctor, arguing that, that by continuing to see her, he was at least tacitly agreeing that what she was doing was okay. Sadly, it was settled out of court for a lot of money. I wish it had gone to court, you know, and, and that, that she, if she had won in court, that at some level at least lets the physician know where mm -hmm. they stand. Um, I think in general, no, I, I, don't, I don't know of any other suits like that um, that are going on out there. But, but it, it's, it is, when, you're, when you, you choose, I mean, I'll give you another example. So, so at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we, we saw this was in, within the past year and a half, we saw a child in our outpatient clinic at two, four, and six months of age. The parents had recently converted to Muslim. They, they felt that that meant that this shouldn't, they, they shouldn't vaccinate their child, although there's nothing in the Muslim faith that says not to do that. Um, at 11 months of age, 12 months of age, the child got uh, streptococcus pneumoniae meningitis caused by a strain that would have been in PCV13 um, and did badly. Mm -hmm. I mean, herniated. You know, brain presses down on the brain stem. We intubated the child and saved his life, but he will never see or walk or speak or hear again. Now, we saw that child in our clinic at two, four, and six months of age. We let that child walk out of that clinic at two, four, and six months of age. Are we at some level responsible, even tacitly agreeing with what, what had happened? I think we are. I, I don't know if we're, we're I, I don't think we're legally responsible. Those, I don't think those parents are going to turn around and sue us, but um, that's why I think at the very least what a physician needs to do is be passionate be and compassionate and prescriptive. And, and, and although we can never leave the science, I think you have to frame that science in an emotional way to let parents know that when they make this choice, they're not making a risk-free choice. It's a choice to take a different and more serious risk, and this is what that risk looks like. Well, I look forward to your future Daily Beast contributions. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and if you have time on the side to uh, in, invent any other vaccines, go for it. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Paul Offit with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you very, Thank very you. much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Offit and Steve, and thanks to our speakers and moderators. We've covered a lot of ground this morning. Um, we heard about the vital science at work, the need to prevent sparks from becoming forest fires, the passion of the anti-vaccination movement and the work of, in this state and beyond to educate on the science and to change people's minds. And as Paul Offit just said, the need to be passionate and prescriptive in the face of a clear and present danger. We heard the stunning story from Minneapolis where the Department of Health and the Imams came together to tackle the measles outbreak and managed to bridge science and faith. And another memorable story from Dr. Penny Heaton of that three-year-old girl in Kissimmee, Kissimmee, Kenya in a crib in a concrete hospital with no electricity in her room, just a ray of sunlight streaming in. And Dr. Heaton told us about watching that child's respiratory rate dropped to zero as she died, and it was of measles, apparently, even though her mother, when she was just one, years old, one year old, had walked 12 miles to get that child a vaccination, but couldn't because robbers had taken all the measles vaccine from the clinic. And so she, like so many, was left incredibly vulnerable. I think um, this morning uh, was a very rich and meaningful conversation, and it's proof that this is a consequential conversation uh, that needs to be had, whether around the world or right here in Pennsylvania. Um, and it's a, it's a story that we will continue to follow um, with great uh, interest and attention. I want to uh, thank uh, our, our, our friends at Pharma for making this conversation possible. And mostly I want to thank you. I, I know uh, it's, your time is probably the most precious thing that any of you have, and so we're enormously grateful that you spent so much of it with us. Um, you've been a wonderful audience. I have one last request before you go. In your chairs or on your tables when you arrive, there was a, uh, a small survey 
Uh, you'll also get an email from me, if you haven't already, which uh, is just asking for your feedback. Um, what you have to tell us is enormously important to us because it informs everything we do. So thank you for taking the time to do that. Thank you for coming here today. We hope to see you again and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.